Good evening, and welcome to the Pittsburgh Public Schools Education Committee meeting. It is Tuesday, October 15th, 2024. My name is Tracy Reed, and I am chair of the Education Committee. Tonight, we have one item on the agenda, the final presentation of the Facilities Utilization Plan. We have Dr. Angela King-Smith here from Education Resource Strategies, and I will turn the meeting over to Dr. Smith. Good evening, Board Chair Walker, Vice Chair Telefaro, the Board of Education Directors, Dr. Walters, administration and staff. I am pleased to present the final ERS report, which will support the facilities utilization plan. This plan provides a unique opportunity to rethink, redesign, and reimagine Pittsburgh Public Schools. Before we dive into the recommendations, I'd like to take um, a few moments to introduce you to Jonathan Travers, president of ERS, who will share a few words with us before diving into the recommendations. Just a few things to note about Jonathan. Jonathan leads the ERS consulting division, overseeing client services across their portfolio of projects within our uh, large uh, work in uh, supporting national school districts around the country. With over two decades of experience at ERS, he has guided numerous projects in some of the nation's largest school districts. His work includes leading resource equity diagnostics in da Dallas and Montgomery County, school funding system re redesign in Atlanta and Cleveland, and providing implementation support in districts like Charlotte and Denver. He also supports all of our CFO networks within our organization. Mr. Travers, please come forward to bring greetings and your message to the Board of Directors, Superintendent, Administration, and the listening public. Thank you, uh, Dr. King-Smith. Uh, good evening, members of the board. Our team's task for the last six months uh, has been to learn as much as we can about this district, its students, uh, its families, and put together a proposal to make bold changes uh, to the mix and configuration of PPS schools across the city in service of the educational needs of all students. I wanted to start by acknowledging uh, the weight of this responsibility, uh, the weight of uh, the weight of uh, this assignment. The education of uh, young people in this city is at stake, and we know that if there were simple, obvious, or easy choices, they would have already been acted upon. Uh, we know that this is hard, important work. I'm proud of the work that we've done. The proposal we're sharing with you tonight represents our best thinking on how PPS can evolve its schools to provide the best educational experience for every student. In developing this proposal over the last several months, we've tried to keep the student experience at the center of our thinking. So yes, we've absolutely listened, and clo and, uh, listened closely and responded to community feedback, as Dr. King-Smith will share. Yes, we've examined the conditions of buildings and adjusted accordingly. Yes, we've looked at operating and capital costs, implications for transportation. We've looked at how potential changes would impact students with disabilities, English language learners, and economically disadvantaged students. Because it's important, one, and two, because we know from history that school consolidations can disproportionately impact students and communities furthest from opportunity unless leadership is really deliberate about advantaging every student. The ERS team has also learned a lot about Pittsburgh and its different neighborhoods and communities. We studied the history of school closure efforts in Pittsburgh going back a generation to try to make sure that our proposal didn't disproportionately impact primarily black communities or neighborhoods that had previously been disproportionately impacted themselves. So we've really tried to balance a lot. Think of this proposal as a solution that has, uh, to a puzzle that has seven or eight or maybe even nine different dimensions. But I want to be clear that however many different dimensions we're dealing with, we've sought to focus on student experience first. What are the configurations of schools, grade level enrollments, the equitable placement of special programs that enable the adults in every school to provide every student with the educational experience that aligns with the superintendent's vision for equity and excellence and gives each student in PPS the best chance of success? Things like richer, uh, things like richer course offerings like algebra and foreign language in the middle school, opportunities for individual attention and small group instruction, uh, stu uh, students with disabilities to be served in inclusive settings, diverse extracurricular offerings that make kids excited to come to school each day, equitable access to themed programming, and so on. 
So I'm proud of the work uh, that Dr. King Smith is sharing tonight, but I also have a lot of humility about the work as well. We are under no illusion that this is all things to all people. Uh, while we've heard over and over from all different stakeholders that PPS has too many seats in too many schools, that something must be done, we do not hear agreement on what that something is. In fact, uh, as Dr. King Smith will speak to shortly, different stakeholders want changes that are just fundamentally incompatible. If some stakeholders want a school to shift to K-5 and others want it to shift to 6-8 and so others want it to remain as K-8, guess what? There's no possible scenario uh, that will align with the interests of all of them. Which leads me to my point here uh, that our goal with this proposal wasn't to be all things to all people, as I said. It was, if we wanted to, that, uh, that wouldn't even, even be possible. It was to give, uh, give you back our best thinking based on our expertise and professional judgment of how to optimize your portfolio of schools and programs across all the dimensions I just named to best serve each and every student in each and every neighborhood in this city. As you learn uh, more about the different parts of this proposal and the rationale, you may identify uh, other alternatives or variations that you think work better. That's great. Uh, what I'd ask you to do is reflect on why you think that's the case. Consider how your alternative approaches prioritize the different dimensions. Are you weighing financial savings differently? Are you valuing the potential for improved student experience differently? Are you weighting the impact on one community or neighborhood more differently uh, than another? The most productive disagreements are often grounded in the why. It may be obvious from what I've already shared, but I want to be, uh, also be clear about this, uh, that this is our proposal and not anyone else's. Of course, we've absolutely listened closely to the perspectives of others, district leadership and staff, parents, students, community members, you name it. And we've gotten some really good ideas from them, as you'll see. Uh, but the corpus of what we're sharing tonight is ours and ours alone. Uh, my colleague, Dr. King Smith, is going to be, the, uh, be in the lead chair or the lead standing position, I guess, not chair, uh, tonight. Uh, so before she jumps in, I do want to offer a final comment on process on how to, and, and on how tonight fits into your decision-making process. So tonight is the culmination of our process for developing a proposal for your por school portfolio, and it's the beginning of your process for understanding it, reflecting on it, and then ulti ultimately making a decision on what to do. As I said before, this is complicated stuff. Uh, many dimensions with layer upon layer of moving parts, interdependencies, and trade-offs. I've been doing this work long enough to know that it's neither realistic nor fair uh, to ask someone to come to a summary judgment on something this complex in a single night, or week, or even month. So tonight isn't about that, coming to judgment. Instead, our goal is to get as deep with you as the time and format allows tonight on the detail of this proposal. What exactly are we proposing? Why were these the choices we made? And how might it all work out? Our role tonight is not to convince or persuade or push for approval. Uh, it's rather to be as clear and specific as possible about our proposal, the reasoning behind it, and what we think it'll take to implement it effectively. As stewards of this institution and stewards of the hopes and dreams of the students and the families that this institution serves, I know you've got a big responsibility. Uh, and we aspire for our analysis and the proposal we present tonight to effectively serve you in delivering on that responsibility for the families you serve. So thank you for engaging deeply with us in the content tonight, and thank you in advance for making the hard decisions uh, when the time comes that you'll need to make, uh, that you'll need for, uh, for each and every student in PPS to achieve academic excellence and develop strong character. Thank you, Mr. Travers. Now I'll get into the actual proposal. Um, we have a lot of content to go through tonight, and so I recognize that I will be talking probably pretty fast, Ms. Smith, um, but I want to make Dr. sure that Smith, we get... I'm sorry. I think one of your computers has the volume on, and it's getting us double feedback. So all the computers should be muted and volume down. And if that's not it, then we'll ask Dave how to fix it. I think it's the TV. It's the television. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry about that. No worries. All right. Now, can 
No echo? We're good now, okay. All right, so tonight I will be covering a lot of content uh, very quickly. Um, let's see here, there we go. So here's our agenda for this evening. It will roughly take me about 90 minutes, or at least I am very hopeful about 90 minutes. It's a lot of content, um, maybe um, a little more or a little less. Um, we have a significant amount of information to share with you this evening, and to get through all the content, I will need to present the information in an abbreviated fashion. There are about 200 or so slides. I will not be covering all of those. Many of those will be included in the appendix to be able to refer to if you have uh, any sort of Q&A. Throughout this presentation, I ask that you write your questions down so that when we get to the end, uh, I can be able to address those questions. Um, like I said, we have a streamlined set of slides um, that we'll be covering, and um, the total time is around 90 minutes or hopefully a little less. The key questions the presentation will answer this evening is, one, what did we learn from stakeholders? Two, why is it important to change and in what areas? Three, what are the final recommendations for school changes? Four, what are the impacts to transportation and financial considerations? And lastly, how should this be phased over time and key considerations for the district? We began this work several, several months ago. Our shared goal was to advance the community's collective vision for equity, excellence, and efficiency through changes to the design of the school portfolio. This plan is focused on improving the educational experiences for all students with inclusive and supporting learning environments. On the screen, you'll see at the end of the day, we believe that this plan will provide eight major benefits. One, we believe it will build a robust student experience as a part of grade configuration changes. Two, we believe that it's gonna be essential that we integrate K-5 and 6-8 gifted and talented programming into local schools. Three, it's gonna be essential that we expand ESL regional sites as well as support students with exceptionalities or disabilities to improve accessibility. We also wanna make sure that we're expanding academic programming and course pathways throughout the district. Another additional thing that is important to this plan, as you all have heard a lot about, is implementing renovations and upgrades to facilities. Also, we think it's gonna be important to change the magnet programming across PPS. We believe there needs to be a focus of magnet programming only at the secondary level. And lastly, we also wanna make sure that you have the spaces you need to support pre-K access. Improving equitable access and driving excellence in schools Creating efficient and modern learning spaces are the top three priorities and serve as foundation for the school changes and recommendations that you're going to hear tonight. We believe that those three foundations or priorities are required to achieve our collective goal. On the screen, you'll see these priorities and throughout you'll hear more about why they are an important foundation to this work. Now let's take a few minutes to share what we heard and learned from stakeholders throughout the stakeholder engagement process. This is a reminder that some of the themes from the stakeholder engagement report that we heard during the initial phase, um, we're gonna share with you what we heard in this phase. For complete details, you may refer to the appendix for more information, or um, if you've got questions at the conclusion of this presentation, I'll be happy to address any questions that you may have at that time. As many of you know, stakeholder engagement was instrumental to the work that was completed over five and a half months. We com completed thousands and received thousands of inputs alongside other data and information to inform our recommendations, and we wanna thank all the parents, students, staff, community members, administrators, community organizers for participating and providing input or feedback throughout this process. Your feedback was instrumental in anchoring our work around the kind of student experience we want for ensuring the recommendation, for making sure that those recommendations are centered on that. Uh, we will make and reflect on the needs and aspirations of students based off of that information. It helped us to shape our final recommendations. 
I recognize that this level of community un engagement was truly unprecedented in PPS, and I believe that it reflects a shared commitment to building a brighter future for all students. It's also important to note that this, pro this process, as Jonathan mentioned, required us to contemplate lots of information. On the screen, you can see nine different pieces of information that we were weighing and balancing throughout. So I want you to keep in mind that community and stakeholder feedback is one of many factors that we took into consideration as a part of the analysis to inform the final recommendations. On this slide, you'll see we utilized a variety of different methods to gather feedback regarding the uh, initial proposals for school changes in PPS. And over the next three slides, you'll see all of the community engagement that was executed. We had thousands of data points, as I mentioned before, throughout the course of this project to inform our final recommendations. In this phase alone, we also had thousands of views on social media, and I know many of you are watching now, um, during our regional meetings and other meetings. We received thousands of surveys and meaningful feedback and input, and we want to thank the PPS community for actively participating in this process. So on the screen, you can see just a highlight of some of those meetings that took place and some of the data that we collected. On the next screen, you'll see some additional meetings and all of the views. As you can see, the regional community meetings on social media, we had over 48,000 views across all four sessions. Additionally, you can see on the next slide, we had some additional meetings, especially in some of our communities, um, that we really wanted to make sure word got out. So we completed uh, some meetings within the Latino community. We also pro provided uh, virtual sessions, public hearings, um, your grant makers and your funding community, and also city leadership. Also for hard to reach families, we also conducted sessions with them as well. On the next slide, you all know that we engaged your middle and high school during the first phase. During this phase, we engaged the elementary and middle schoolers. We received 4,000 surveys. You had students from kindergarten to eighth grade participate, and you can see those numbers on the screen. And they gave us their true feedback. So let's get into some of the data. So, like I said, that we received 4,000 surveys from elementary and middle school students across PPS. We received surveys from every school but one. We received surveys from every grade level, including kindergarten. And you may wonder, so how did a kindergartner give you feedback related to facilities changes? Well, we used emojis. On the screen, you can see the demographics for this survey. Elementary students told us what they were concerned about. Safety at school, cleanliness at school, having access to art, music, and gym, PE or playground time, access to outdoor spaces. Half of the elementary students would be very excited about a renovated or repaired building. I know I read through many of those comments. Some of the comments, even from some of your babies, said, please just paint the walls. More than half of elementary students would be very excited about trying new subjects or classes. This survey, along with other feedback from families, the public meetings, and pop-ups gave us great insight to help us inform our recommendations. Again, I don't have time to go through all of the data. It'll be in the appendix. On the next slide, throughout the engagement process, participants shared a wide range of views on the initial proposal and draft scenario. However, there were kind of, you know, two sides. There were support for school changes. The community expressed support for changes that provided more direct support for students, particularly for English learners and students with disabilities, as well as addressing inequities across schools. There was strong support for expanding course offerings and activities. I know that one um, uh, form that we saw said, yeah, I can understand. It's not right. Students should have access to art, music, and PE. 
increasing seats in high demand programs for local students also, reconfigured grades to traditional, to the traditional 6-8 structure, had a lot of support. And you might be surprised. Actually, the students were in great support of the 6-8 structure, especially for those currently in a 6-12 structure. Now, there was opposition to the community expressed concerns about the impact of school closures on students, potential increases in school, school sizes and class sizes due to consolidation, safety issues, particularly in the Carrick and Brashear high schools. There was also opposition to the grade configuration to a traditional 6-8, especially from the K-8 families at Colfax. But I think it's important to understand that on both sides of the school closure and consolidation or school changes, there was also common ground. Both supporters and opponents of school changes agreed on the importance of prioritizing diverse needs of PPS students. The teacher center concept was well received across all groups and there was shared concern about transportation impacts. Additionally, stakeholders emphasized the need for clear communication understanding the rationale for school changes, timeline and process for school changes that was seen on both sides of the aisle. All communities feedback was carefully reviewed and incorporated into our analysis and with many suggestions reflected in the revised scenario and recommendations that you'll see shortly. The many diverse viewpoints we received are a true strength to this process. However, this also means there is no single solution that we will have a unanimous support. We are grateful for the robust participation throughout this process. And you will see that many of the recommendations include specific ideas suggested by parents, students, and the community. And we wanna thank you for your input. So let's actually get into the recommendations. Let's see our final recommendations. And in the next few slides, I will walk you through the six key recommendations that apply to many schools in this final scenario. These global recommendations are the foundation for all proposed school changes. So before we explore the updated scenario in detail, I need to spend some time explaining each of these global recommendations so that you can understand the uh, specific ch scenario changes. This data also supports the recommendations that we made and our rationale for these significant changes. So the first global recommendation is focused on improving change or driving change at the magnet status of schools to reflect the district's vision for academic offerings at each grade level. We um, have broken this recommendation into three parts. So around the magnet status, we've got three little sub recommendations, if you will. The first one is around discontinuing most or all K-5 magnet programs to emphasize consistent foundational programming in all K-5 schools. It allows for consistent and expanded course offerings and supports in K-5 schools. It eliminates highly regarded and valued programs, some with wait lists. So I wanna unpack this recommendation with you right now. I think one of the huge misnomers is that magnet schools are the only way to offer specialized academic programming at the pre-K through five level. That is a misnomer. Um, I know that's the way it's been done quite some time in PPS, but they are, it is not the only way to offer specialized programming. Traditional pre-K fives can also offer programs like STEM or language immersion within their regular curriculum. 
By integrating uh, these specialized programs, you can ensure that students across all schools have access to innovative, high quality educational opportunities without the need to designate a school as a magnet. So I have a little Venn diagram on the screen. On the left, you see magnet schools. On the right, traditional schools. Magnets are schools that have an application process. And I know that many folks within the community don't even understand exactly how to get to a magnet school. Um, so it, is, uh, it requires an application. The application involves a lottery or selection process. Um, and then they offer some specialized programming to go along with it. Traditional schools can, are local schools that can serve students based on their home address and are automatically enrolled within the surrounding community. There is no application process required. And so I want to decouple this idea that magnets are the only way to offer specialized academic programming because it's simply not true. So let's take a look on the next screen. I want to talk about some terms. So given the district's vision for equity and including opportunities for access and removing barriers, we believe it's important that the district revisit the magnet status of schools, pre-K through 12. Let me go over a few terms and definitions so I can highlight the difference between what is currently offered versus what we're recommending for the future. In the current offerings, there are three designations right now in PPS. There are neighborhood schools, full magnets and partial magnets, and you can see the little line underneath uh, the left-hand side of the screen. Neighborhood school service, students who live within the neighborhood school attendance zones. Your full magnets are schools where the magnet theme applies across the entire building. They do not have a neighborhood feeder pattern, and students must apply to attend these schools. Partial magnets are neighborhood schools that also accept st students from across the district and have a focused magnet program or overall school theme. Now the magnet or the theme programming is not guaranteed to be offered to the entire school. That means that some schools may only provide programming to select students who formally enrolled in the magnet program. Other schools may provide programming to all students. So it just varies. We are recommending that PPS discontinue partial magnets given the district's goals around improving equity and access. We want to recommend the creation of a new term, neighborhood magnets, which are schools that enroll students from across the city and provides quality programming while guaranteeing seats for students within the local neighborhood. Unlike partial magnets, um, that you have today, these neighborhood magnets would ensure that all students in the building wall to wall have access to the same programming. When we uh, review these school changes later in this presentation, I will share which schools we recommend move their current magnet status, whether it's partial or whether it's full, um, to a different status. So you'll learn a little bit more in the future. Now, one of the things I think is important to also understand and where we did our research, there's significant variation in the demand across the district's magnet schools. Now you may think, and I think it's also a misnomer, that all the schools are in high demand. That's not true. Um, and so on the screen, you can see every school across the district and the number of open seats, which is the blue, and the number of applications, which is the green. So reviewing the data from the last three application cycles for magnets, we noticed a few interesting trends. One, the chart shows, um, like I said, those number of open seats and the demand for those seats. And how we think of demand is if there's at least two applications for every one seat. Um, that's what we'd like to see. The not so ideal situation is to have the green bar 
less than the number of available seats. In those cases, you have empty seats or lower enrollment at those schools. And reviewing this data from the last few years, we noted that you've got a number of secondary schools, high school magnets that have great interest and great demand. A number of your elementary magnets don't have the same level of interest and oftentimes have difficulty filling their open seats. There is an exception to that, and that is the Montessori Pre-K-5. Discontinuing, discontinuing most or all your K-5 magnet programs to emphasize consistent foundational programming in all K-5 schools. Many of the elementary schools, um, as I noted, do not have significant demand based on the application trends over the last few years. And in some cases, there were not enough applications to cover those available seats. Many of these magnet schools have small enrollments as low as 100. I believe it, it will be greatly beneficial if all children throughout PPS can have the consistent foundational programming across all schools. Now on the next slide you'll see we also recommend uh, through our conversations we've heard a lot of people uh, talk about the policies that make magnet access inequitable. So we have a global recommendation, this is 1B, uh, to review and adjust lottery magnet weights to ensure no single demographic group is disproportionately advantaged or disadvantaged. And so on the screen you'll see we believe it's important to look at your lottery weights, your eligibility criteria, your continuation programs, as well as your session policies, rescission policies. On the slide, this is from the PPS Communications Department and from leadership. Highlighted here is a slide with Dr. Walter's vision to create strong foundational experiences at every single grade level. So this is not our slide, but as many of you know, they're in the process or have just released their strategic plan and a part of their work is to make sure that, that all students have access to foundational um, educational experiences, um, K-5, access to developmentally responsive education, 6-8, as well as access to success in high school and beyond. This mirrors much of what we'd like to see moving forward in the district a strong educational experience for all students regardless of which school they attend, and ensuring that they have, are receiving a well-rounded, nurturing environment that addresses academic, social, emotional, and physical growth. On the next slide, you'll see we uh, the next recommendation um, around 1C to change the magnet status of schools uh, serving your 6, 8, and 9, 12 to expand access to specialized programming and enable neighborhood feeders. So we believe it's important to discontinue your magnet programs K-5, but at your 6, 8, and your 9, 12, after you've invested in K-5 students to give them the skills, to give them uh, the supports needed to successfully apply to the magnets, um, then uh, you know, having the specialization at your secondary level. So you'll see a few changes that we are gonna get into in a moment, um, but we think it's important that the specialization happens later, after they've had music, art, and PE, and some of the other things that they need to actually successfully apply to programs. On the next slide, you think, you'll see that we also um, believe it's important to create more consistent grade configurations to enable developmentally appropriate supports and consistent K-5 programming and tr transition grades. This allows to, for that developmentally appropriate supports. It also ensures that there can be consistency across schools and emphasizes the consistent foundational programming and resources. So we think this is important at, uh, across the, the district. So let's talk about your regional ESL sites. 
We believe it's important to add more regional ESL sites for <coughs> across the board, but especially in the north where there is a growing EL population. Over the past decade, the district has experienced growth in your EL, your EL population, increasing um, from 557 students back in 2011-2012 to um, in 2023, 2024, you had 1,427. So 1,427 students. We also believe it's important to look at how to relocate your programs for students with ex exceptionalities to enhance accessibility and to better serve student needs. Um, because again, this is another uh, growing um, populations which is now represents about 23% of your total student population. I know we've talked a lot about this one, and so we'll get into the details around this one, but it is gonna be important to consolidate schools with low and declining enrollments to increase students' access to diverse staff and offerings. If you've got some tiny schools operating and trying to make ends meet, you know, around 100. So we think it's important to consolidate those schools um, and so that students can have opportunities and so on the next slide you'll see here I talked a lot about music art and PE but that red line on there shows um, the number that you need in order to be able to get to um, have dedicated art music and PE and so the green bars are your K5s and your um, blue are your current K8s and that shows the enrollment and so, so many of your schools are below the red line. They can't offer that. They can't afford it. So we think it's important to be able to consolidate, to be able to provide those opportunities for your students. Right now, at the 6-8 level, um, again, because you have some really tiny middle schools, um, this means that they can only offer the basics with some exceptions. This is just a reminder, only 13 out of 23 middle schools offer algebra, which is a critical gateway grade for higher level mathematics for high school, um, and then to be able to go on a, to a path towards college. Only three out of 23 schools offer STEAM, in addition to standards sixth, seventh, and eighth grade science, and only four out of 23 of your middle schools offer any type of world language. Global recommendation five is to renovate school buildings to accommodate larger schools and to ensure access to state-of-the-art amenities. We believe it's important to expand the physical footprint of school buildings where there's opportunities. Um, to one, adjust for uh, growing enrollment and changes uh, in, in school configurations, to continue adding air conditioning to every school building, um, and to add dedicated spaces um, for a range of great appropriate learning activities, including art, music, career and technical education spaces, science labs, and dedicated uh, cafeteria, libraries, and gyms. Then finally, we think it's important to repurpose uh, available space to support community partnerships and professional learning. And as we talked about in our previous August 13th proposal, we believe adding three teacher centers across the district can really support professional learning and growth for your staff, one for elementary, another one for middle, and then lastly for high school grades nine through 12. Creating that dedicated space will allow for that professional growth. And then also finding space to, for, to partner, uh, partner in services to support schools and students. Then lastly, as I mentioned before, we think it's important for renovations. Last year, I believe you had five heat days because of the, the temperature. 
And when we look at the total number of schools that don't have air conditioning, um, that's about 60% of your students are impacted when there are heat days. And then my understanding is that you've had about two or half days this year. So it's gonna be really important to um, continue investing in the infrastructure upgrades across the board. So those are the major global recommendations. I'm gonna take a moment to put on the screen. So beyond that student experience, beyond the student experience, what factors were considered uh, when determining the final recommendations for school changes? And these are all on the screen. We looked at both low and declining enrollment. We looked at the building capacity, the location of schools and where they are and where students live. Um, we also looked at if there was possibilities for changes to um, a particular community. We looked at historically marginalized communities and we studied, as Jonathan mentioned, we went back several decades understanding when uh, school uh, changes had occurred in the past. We looked at the facilities assessment report that was completed by the district. Um, we, as I mentioned, we looked at prior closures and where they were located. We looked at the needs around your special education population, around your ESLs, um, uh, ESL, growth in ESL, where those families are located, and we also looked at community feedback. So there was no one single thing that identified school changes or identified a particular closure. Rather, we looked at all these factors for each region to weigh out the pros and the cons for each one. All right, let's get into the changes and the updated scenario. So let's look at the north. This is the current feeder pattern for the North. It's comprised of eight schools, as well as several early childhood centers located throughout. Here's our recommended changes for the North. We're recommending the following organization of schools. One, uh, three ESL centers, one uh, pre-K located in the fully renovated building in the North View building. I'll talk about that in a moment. Maintaining Allegheny and Morrow as pre-K fives and building a new middle school at the Manchester site. Bringing on um, STEM programming at the secondary levels at the new middle school and within the Perry High School. Um, these changes now, um, it, with these changes, there would be five schools in the north um, as compared to the current eight schools now. We would recommend that the following schools close due to very small enrollments. Schiller at 225 students, Spring Hill at 125 students, and closing King with, um, and closing King, which shifts with additional shifts to attendant zones. So we heard a lot of community feedback highlighted um, regarding some of the locations, but we heard a lot of feedback regarding King, um, regarding safety and security concerns around King. The K-5 students would attend Allegheny from, from King which is in close proximity to the current King site and would not require significant increases to transportation times for those students. Additionally, the King space could be used as a sp swing space to house students during renovation, which significantly decreases construction time for the new facilities. The proposed map is on the screen based off the recommendations that I just covered. And now I wanna talk about some of the specific locations within this area and within the north. So some of the rationale 
um, for having the district-wide shift to move away. So part of what you're gonna see on the following slides is that grade configuration was applied here. So um, the district shift to move away from the uh, co-location of a K-5 and a 6-8 in the same building. So we needed to separate that out to provide uh, developmentally appropriate supports. Allegheny Pre-K-5 is a very strong, one of the district's highest performing Pre-K-5 schools across student groups. So it's not just one student group that's getting really great education. All the students that are attending there, when we look at the sub, uh, sub, sub demographic data. So maintaining and expanding this school increases the quality of programming to um, families in that area. The King Building um, would be looked at as an alternative option in this area. However, which we really did look at that, but based off of community feedback, it really highlighted some of the safety and security concerns surrounding that building. Manchester. So the existing Manchester would close. It, as you can see on the screen, has low and declining pre-K enrollment, but the building offers promise and sufficient space to increase capacity and renovate facilities for a full 6-8, for a full 6-8 middle school. We know that there are charters in that area and some other schools, and we believe that this, by establishing a strong 6-8 in a brand new, fully renovated building, could attract families back to the district. There is a growing population of EEL uh, learners, and uh, specifically in this north. So adding a regional ESL at this brand new renovated building would improve access to services and support. Um, and so I think in the original August 13th presentation, we were looking at um, potentially moving uh, or having some, another school here. Um, but we think that this is like the best option for the families in this area and um, bringing on a brand new middle school at that Manchester site. There is access behind the building for fields and other things. So we would make sure that that would be included within this. So community feedback highlighted the importance of having a K-5 option east of Route 279. The current K-5 option in this area, Spring Hill, presents significant capacity constraints. So this is another brand new building that we are recommending. A significant portion of the EL, EL students in the area currently attend Arsenal. So offering an ESL site in the Northview area would provide an option within walking distance for these families. And, or, would cut down transportation time and challenges for others, especially your ESL population. The surrounding neighborhood offers opportunities for community partnerships, which can increase access to services and supports for both families and students. And this move would require significant renovations to this building. So we are not saying move in at, at the current building now. What we're recommending is that this facility be undergo major renovations um, to shape the vision for a brand new school. No, sir. I mean a renovated, a major renovation overhaul on the building. And so in the north, um, we, in terms of the summary of additional programming in the north, there would be a STEM pathway from Manchester to Perry. Regional ESL sites open in Manchester, the new Manchester Middle School, Perry, 912, and the new Northview site. So um, the other thing I just want to stress before I go into this next set of schools in the south um, is that you'll see our proposal centers on regional high schools. 
regional high schools and making sure that there's a clear feeder from the middle to the high school and that the, there's continuity and programming from the middle to the high. Something different than what you have right now, but it is at the center of this proposal. So let's take a look at the south and the west. There are 12 schools in this area and there are a variety of school types. So on the screen, you can see um, all the schools that are in this area, including some full magnets, early childhood centers, ESL locations. Here's the current feeder patterns for the south and the west. There are six schools in the south and the west within the Carrick regional area. Let's get into the changes and what we're proposing and recommending. We're proposing the following changes. One, we're proposing two feeder middle schools for this area. Classical and Carmalt would serve as six, eight middle schools aligned to Brashear High School. This proposal on the screen includes 10 schools, and we would organize the schools focused on the following changes. One, South Hills would close, and the current magnet programs at Classic and Carmel would be changed to neighborhood magnets. These schools would move from full magnets, guaranteeing uh, seats um, to ensure that every child in the neighborhood has a seat. Additionally, four ESL regional locations would support ESL families in this area. An ESL center would be added to Carmalt. And the early childhood centers would be located at Langley, Whittier, Brookline, and Beechwood. You may be wondering about Grandview. So let's take a look. Grandview would be one of three elementary schools aligned to Arlington Middle School and Carrick High School. Arlington now, a pre-K-8, would shift to being a 6-8 middle school. This area would maintain all the early childhood centers and ESL center. The pre-K-5 uh, located at Roosevelt would close. However, the early childhood center would stay at the primary building. The total number of schools would be five. Now, I know, and I can hear them over social media. In our previous August 13th presentation, I know, we were contemplating changes at Carrick High School. After close examination, hearing from the students and the community and reviewing additional information, we decided to change our recommendation for this area. Um, so we are not closing Carrick High School. Again, our proposal centers around regional high schools. So Carrick as a regional high school is important to this model. The district should continue and implement CTAE programs along with rigorous college preparatory curricula in the district in the regional high schools. The executive director of CTE or career and technical education, Angela Mike, has vast knowledge and recommendations for how to expand CTE programming in PPS. Additionally, to be in alignment with other district high schools, a magnet pathway would be opened up at Carrick High School. And this should provide a continuation of programming from the middle school to the high school. So programming would need to be determined for Arlington and Carrick around that specialization piece. Here's a map of how those proposed schools would lay out. And let's talk about a few of the changes and why we decided to make those changes. So at Carmel, the district shift would be from K-5 to 6-8 programs to provide better developmentally appropriate supports to students. Again, we applied the K-5 to 6-8. We had to have some middle schools um, and nice size middle schools in order to be able to offer the programming that students deserve. So highly regarded STEM programming will be retained 
through um, the STEM programming. Access will be increased to neighborhood students for those students living in that area. There's a growing number of EL populations, so adding regional ESL sites in the southern region would improve access to supports and services. And Carmel has amenities more suitable for middle school. So they got a separate cafeteria and gym and auditorium and recently um, updated AC. Arlington. Again, K-5, 6-8 split to provide developmentally appropriate supports to students. There are a lot of students currently living in the surrounding Arlington area, making this ideal location for the 6-8. So they're already there. They can just go to school right there. Building has suitable amenities for middle school, gym, cafeteria, auditorium, and it also has a field behind for middle school athletics. Roosevelt has low and slightly declining enrollment, um, which provides a challenge for offering a full and robust K-5 experience for students. However, we know that there is a really great early childhood center, and um, the Roosevelt Primary would become an early childhood center um, while the intermediate building can be utilized for specialized programs. I'll cover that in a moment. Here's a summary of some of those changes around specialized middle school focus at Arlington, Carmel, and Classical, more regional ESL science, one opens at Carmel, neighborhood magnets added at Carrick to be consistent with the other high schools, and Roosevelt becoming an early uh, childhood center. Let's get in to the east and central. Here's the current map. There are seven in the Malayans um, area. There are seven schools, five early childhood centers, Alderdice, nine schools, three early childhood centers. Westinghouse, there are four schools and three early childhood centers. And this area has some magnets. So we'll talk about those magnets. It's home to several magnets, and so we're gonna talk about some of those changes. Okay, let's start on the right-hand side of the slide first. The Alderdice feeder is mostly about grade configuration changes. At the high school, Alderdice has no changes. Colfax would be a middle school and would transition from a K-8 school to a 6-8 school. Students in grades K-5 would attend either Greenfield, Liberty, or Madero. K-5, um, and so this allows for <laughs> that specialized academic programming, make sure that they're getting the classes that they need in order to be competitive in high school, um, and also your Mifflin uh, would transition from, Greenfield and Mifflin would transition from a pre-K-8 to a pre-K-5. The students at Mifflin that are in 6-8 would attend Colfax. There would be um, ESL students, uh, ESL uh, programming at Colfax. Mandero, there's no programmatic or grade level changes. So those are the changes for the Alder Dice on the right hand side. So now let's talk about the left hand side. Okay, so your Obama, which is a full magnet now, would transition, and it would the grade configuration would go from a 612 to a 912. The students that are 68 would attend Arsenal. This school shift um, would also include moving from a full magnet to a neighborhood magnet. The IB programming would be maintained. And the IB programming um, 
at the high school level as well as the middle years program at Arsenal. Um, Arsenal would adopt that IB program and become a 6-8 IB MYP program or and a neighborhood magnet. While Liberty and Sunnyside would be the K-5 schools for this feeder, Wool Slayer, Miller, and Arsenal PK-5 schools would close. The early child centers uh, are located on the screen. Now, you may wonder, in our last proposal, uh, we had different schools in this area closing. And what we, after going back and looking at the data, the information, the amenities, especially given the larger size for schools, there was a switch. So while is more centrally located, it has better amenities, and we also heard you through the community feedback, which contributed to our decision to utilize this school in our final scenario and proposal. Westinghouse. Westinghouse would be reorganized into a 912 high school. It would transition from a 612 to a 912. Your 68 students would attend Starrett. In addition, the high school would add a neighborhood magnet to be consistent with other 912 schools. Starrett would become a neighborhood school and it would develop a specialized academic program for the school. Dilworth, which I know is a full magnet now, our recommendation has that it would become a neighborhood school. Remember, they can still maintain the same academic programming without the magnet status. Lincoln and Faison, there are no changes. Fulton Pre-K-5 would close, and the Pre-K-5 um, students would attend Dilworth. So, Fulton Pre-K-5 closes, this, those students would uh, be assigned to Dilworth. The Fulton Early Childhood student, students would also attend Dilworth. The Crescent Center would um, be maintained. Um, there is no change there. Let's discuss the magnets that would shift to neighborhood magnets and how they would be organized. So first, with SciTech, SciTech would stay in its, its existing building. The 6-8 would be relocated at the Malayans building. So SciTech would move from a full magnet to being a neighborhood magnet. I already spoke to this before, but you can see on the screen, Obama would move from a full magnet to a neighborhood magnet and Arsenal would um, be a neighborhood magnet with the IB <coughs> MYP program. I'll review Kappa in the Montessori um, pre-K-5 in a moment. In our proposal, these will remain a citywide or full magnets. They are the only exception um, to this process, I'll share in a moment why. Here's a map of the proposed school and the number of schools um, for the east and the central. Let's talk about Colfax. It would, um, you know, again, we are separating the K-5 and the 6-8 programs to better provide developmentally appropriate supports to students. Um, Minadero Greenfield provide nearby options for current K Colfax students in the south section of, of this. Um, and so of the current Colfax zone, while Liberty provides a nearby option for students in the north section. Colfax has suitable facilities um, to be a 6-8. It, is, it has the gym and the cafeteria and the lab space for a middle school. There is no other building in that area that is appropriate. So it is the only choice if you're gonna have a middle school. Um, 
Westinghouse, um, district-wide shift for the 6-8 to the 9-12, so that, you know, like I said, there is strong support to have Westinghouse retain the 9-12 grades. Starrett is just over one mile away, making it the closest middle school for 6-8 students, and um, currently offers strong CTE programs or career technical education programs, and a neighborhood magnet can increase available offerings and provide more opportunities for students. Obama would become a 912 um, high school, again, because of the this, this separation of the grade configurations. Splitting programs into two programs, into two buildings, allows for potential to expand programs and increase open seats to meet demand for IB programming. Low and de declining enrollment for 612 um, prohibits provision of robust programming and staffing. So this is a way to um, really, for a program that's working well, to be able to boost uh, enrollment and focus. Arsenal becoming um, an IB MYP neighborhood magnet. Again, it allows for us to expand and increase open seats to meet demand for IB MYP. SciTech. Uh, it provides a dedicated campus for both 6, 8, and 9, 12. It improves district ability to expand SciTech programming, um, but more importantly, it also provides for more students, more students to meet the demand. The Lions is 1.2 mile drive from the SciTech campus, and the building has significant capacity for renovations and specialty. Um, I have to say, uh, again, in our feedback, especially um, both in our pop-ups as well as uh, collecting feedback, this had a lot of support. Oh, sorry, I didn't click the slide. Okay, let's go to this one. Sunnyside would become a pre-K uh, school and a regional ESL site um, to be able to serve the students in that area. This building also has the capacity to take on additional students from Arsenal and Wool Slayer. And we think with the additional students and the programming that it can help to boost enrollment. Within the East and the Central, there would be specialized middle schools and programming developed at Colfax and Starrett, regional K-5 sites at Sunnyside, neighborhood magnets added at Arsenal, middle school IB MYP program, Obama high school IB program, the Lions, the middle school would be the middle school SciTech, and SciTech high school, um, there would be a SciTech high school separated from where it is right now. So you would have a neighborhood magnet added at Westinghouse to be consistent with the other high schools. Let's get into the other or the full magnets. I told you we would come back to Kappa. Let's do that. Maintaining full magnet status and six in, within the six to 12 grade configuration. Um, Kappa is a very, very, very specialized program. And when you all built the facilities, it was extremely expensive. Um, millions and millions and millions of dollars. So if you were to split this program, you'd have to spend millions and millions of dollars again to get the facilities to address the highly specialized nature of this program. There are places in this district that need investment and they need it now. This is not the place, the time, it's expensive to split this program. Also nationally, when you look at large urban school districts that have a highly specialized programming like Kappa, performing arts school, do they have five? No. Do they have two? No, they have one. So this specialized space that's been created at the current Kappa location 
should remain. Specialized spaces and amenities are all throughout the current CAPA location. They have the staff required for programming arts curriculum that's shared between the 6, 8, and the 9, 12. Renovating another building for a separate 6, 8 would require significant investment. Building is centrally located in your cultural district and has access to public transportation. And so if this is something the district really wants to do, I suggest that it's deprioritized until after the investment is made and other communities that need the investment now. All right, your Montessori program. Currently located in the Friendship Building, students cannot remain in that Friendship Building. They have to move out. So your current Friendship Building requires major, major renovation. It's also a historic uh, a building that potentially could be used for the community. Um, so what we're proposing is that this program move to the Linden Building. Now, some of you might say, yeah, but why? Why do they get to keep their pre-K uh, through five full magnet versus the rest? Well, I wanna remind you to go back to the beginning of the presentation regarding that demand. It is the only pre-K through five that has more applications and more demand than any other elementary school. They have three times the current enrollment for every open seat. No other school has that level of demand. Given the unique nature of Montessori programming, this should remain a full magnet um, with changes to enrollment policies. However, I urge the folks that lead that school that when they move to this new building, that they reach out to other families and communities to access this programming. A lot of people don't know about your program, and so it's, there's a lot of misconceptions there. And so in terms of diversity, it's not a very diverse school. But moving it to the Linden Building would allow this school to grow and add seats. So some of the schools I have not talked about, attendance zones or enrollment changes, enrollment lines. And so let me talk about it now, because some of y'all might be wondering, so what does this include in terms of some of those zone changes? Where can I find this information? So some of the school grades and reconfigurations included in this proposal require changes to be made to current attendance zones. Details regarding the attendance zone changes can be found in the appendix of this document. Here you'll see notes regarding our assumptions around what needs to happen for each of these um, schools and the school changes uh, to drive our work. In this presentation, we'll be detailing these attendance zone changes at a high level, at a high level. We will not be showing exactly what these new attendance boundaries will be. We've ensured that the attendance zones shift um, and that there, you know, there's feasibility within what we have recommended, but it's important to note, as I saw some people taking pictures, that this is not final. This is not final. There is an important implementation step that has to happen after the district receives this proposal. They have to work with the demogra demographer and determine exactly where the new lines will be. So here's a little analogy, I love analogies. We used a butter knife to do our attendance zone patterns. To give a good estimate, to give a good idea. But what needs to happen with this proposal is that an X-Acto knife or a sharp knife, very precise, street by street, to determine exactly where the lines will be. 
So this is a good like sort of ballpark, but this is not final. So please note that. The other thing I just want to highlight so I know some of you probably noticed there's a gray bar covering up about 25% of this or 20%. If you are located within Liberty, Sunnyside, Wild, Dilworth, Faison, Lincoln, you all remember we made some recommendations around Obama, stare at Westinghouse, and they sit in the middle of that area the district has to go and make some determinations as to which high school will be made in terms of the alignment. So that is why there's a gray box, because there's some work that has to happen there. The other thing I'll say, like I said, this is a very general kind of guesstimate of these feeder patterns. Um, you also have some little nooks and crannies of neighborhoods that kind of got cut out during the last school changes um, that don't quite make sense in my mind. Um, those also may be revisited. But this gives you a good idea. So let's look at everything in totality. There is a summary of proposed changes for your special schools. On the screen, you will see a summary of, of, of those special schools and lo potential locations for this. Again, details regarding these final moves must be finalized with the district and the district team. Um, there's, like I said, it's a proposal. The directors for each of those or executive directors need to verify and finalize. 14 traditional schools are slated for closure. The resulting vacant space would be repurposed to meet a variety of organizational needs, including placement of teacher, professional development centers, um, or other special programs. So this just kind of gives you a bird's eye view um, based off of our proposal. On the next slide, you'll see um, there are three special schools slated for relocation as a result using those vacant spaces. Again, up to the district to finalize, but again, this is our initial sort of proposal. We also have to get those three teacher centers in here, so those are not uh, determined in terms of space. So these vacant spaces um, could be the teacher centers or other services that the district um, deem important. 12 schools would change their grade configuration, and those are highlighted on the screen. Full magnets would phase out and become neighborhood schools. You can see those on the screen, and we talked through many of them. Two partial magnets would phase out and become neighborhood schools at Phillips and Starrett. and three new school buildings, or three new schools. School buildings would be at, North, brand new school buildings would be at Northview and Manchester, major renovation, tear down the walls, start all over again. Well, maybe not tear down the walls, um, but major renovation. And then at SciTech also would be a new school, Emma Lyons. Now we talked about in our previous presentation a little bit about so which students would be impacted? What's the percent of students that would be impacted by this proposal or scenario? It is slightly lower. So for those who, of you who had um, the number of impacted students from the previous August 13th presentation, it is slightly lower. Why might you ask? Because there are fewer schools being closed. The total number of students um, um, is lower. And another thing I want to highlight, the minimal number of students who are impacted by school changes is just that. It's a minimal impact. If there are questions around the detailed methodology with this, I'm happy to go over that. 
but we really, really looked at all the students um, and where they currently attend uh, in their, their neighborhood school, in their attendance zone, where they currently live. And then we looked at a couple of uh, different exceptions. And then we looked at, based off of the assumptions we made around our attendance zones um, and where students would be assigned, who would be impacted by the changes that we recommended. Um, but again, the percentages here represent all students that would be moved based off of you know, either the grade configuration changes or the physical school changes. As the data denotes here, fewer schools would require moderate or major renovation costs. And so Jonathan is about to come up and speak about the financial and the transportation impacts. But I think it's important to note here, if you've got fewer schools, then it's less work or money that has to be spent. Um, the two schools in need of major renovations, as I mentioned before, are your Manchester and your Northview. So I, I wanna show the map. I'm gonna ask Jonathan to go ahead and come up. But here's the map of all the traditional future schools, the numbers at each level in terms of the school types um, so that you can have sort of a bird's eye view of what the map of the, the, of what the future schools would look like with all the changes that we just covered. All right. Okay, how are we doing? Good. Um, my job here is to get into the detail, into a little bit of summary of the transportation analysis uh, that we did for this, and then also the fiscal, uh, some fiscal um, impacts and considerations. Um, so to jump right into transportation, part of what we did we, was we tried to analyze, okay, given the changes that we're seeing, what does that mean for percent of students who would be in walk zone versus out of walk zone as defined by, as defined by uh, the district, uh, elementary, middle, and high. Um, you can see the, the numbers uh, here. Um, at the, so overall, a slight increase of students moving into their walk zone, so closer to the school that they're attending. That is largely driven by, as you can see, uh, ele the elementary grade levels, grade, grades K to five, and that is largely driven by um, the change in magnets. Students coming out of, being transported far away to magnets to returning to neighborhood schools. Uh, at the middle grades, uh, you can see that there's a small increase, uh, three, four percent increase in the percent of students who are shifting from walk zone to busing. Um, we did an analysis by feeder pattern to say, okay, well, what does that look like in terms of actual like transportation time? We can't calculate the bus routes yet, but we can say we know the, the home address, we know the school address, so we can calculate the, the sort of the drive time distance. Um, and so we looked at that by feeder pattern. The feeder pattern that had the most significant increase in average drive time was Westinghouse. Uh, that average increase in drive time was 90 seconds, a minute and a half. So we feel like, yes, there are some shifts in, in, uh, in uh, more students uh, now being out of walk zone into transport, but not significantly impacting uh, commute time. High school remains uh, very flat because, as you know, we're not proposing significant changes to, to high school enrollment. And you've got much more detail on all of this in the full, full materials. Turning to financial considerations, just to be clear on this, um, we want a district, we want the district to be good stewards of financial resources. We want the district to, to create the configuration and portfolio of schools that is right for kids, that serves students effectively. Uh, so, but fiscal stewardship is, is important, so we want to make sure that we're looking at the impact of the changes that we have um, financially. As we think about, um, as we uh, define finances, uh, you can think about it in terms of annual operating costs, and you can think about it in terms of capital costs. So let me talk about each of them uh, independently for a minute here. Uh, on the operating side, we think that there's two categories of costs, really. There's sort of the student-facing costs of costs of staff that are serving students. As those students move to other schools, those staff largely move with them. 
So there's a dislocation cost, but it isn't necessarily like reduction in headcount kind of thing. There are some fixed costs that, that we actually, that we can capture savings on. Uh, that's utilities. We think of a school principal um, as we're just slimming down the total number of schools we have. So there are some fixed costs, and I'll share a little bit more detail on that uh, in a second. One point to, to note on the operating side, that to the extent that positions are coming out as a result of this, uh, we generally, this would be done over, uh, staged over multiple years. We do not foresee, if it's implemented in this way, um, an actual reduction in, in the, no layoffs. Like people wouldn't actually lose their jobs. You'd just be capturing natural uh, attrition. You'd be capturing vacancies as those vacancies come up. So people would be moving, but you wouldn't, largely depending on given that you implement over a number of years, you wouldn't be taking position, uh, headcount out. On the capital side, um, there are three things going on in terms of capital spending. So first is you are deprioritizing significant outstanding needs in schools that we're proposing for consolidation. Second, we are creating uh, uh, the need for previously unplanned investment in schools where their uh, new target enrollment exceeds the school's capacity or where there, where there be programmatic needs that differ from the current configuration. And then third is everything else. If you had an outstanding need today, you will have that and the school is running uh, open, you'll have that outstanding need tomorrow. So there's a bunch of capital need that remains unchanged. Um, the, 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 the primary point on the capital side, as Angela alluded to earlier, you're reducing the number of schools that are in need of capital investment. You're therefore able to accelerate the rate at which students are receiving the benefit of that investment and ultimately, I think, probably uh, doing right by students in the process. Um, let me go into uh, the annual operating part. As I said, there's two parts to this. Uh, the staffing that um, it comes out uh, or is displaced uh, as a result of uh, consolidations, we estimate that to be about 10 million. Uh, much of that, as I'll share in a second, is simply just displacement and moving with students. There is some utilities costs uh, uh, that can be captured in closed buildings. And then we're being conservative and not projecting a transportation cost um, savings. As you saw before, you have a larger share of students that are going to be in walk zone uh, than, uh, than um, being transported. So there will be, as we get closer to, as you all get closer to implementation, there'll be closer analysis that you'll need to do of the actual routes to determine the magnitude of the savings. We don't foresee there being additional cost, but we wanted to err on the side of being conservative and not forecast additional savings in transportation. I want to say a little bit more about the displaced staffing uh, costs. Um, we think that for the most part, those shift with students. Uh, you could imagine we just pulled up two schools here as just to, two uh, schools as a sample here. You could imagine that this gives the district an opportunity to rethink its staffing model, to say, well, what is the minimum? What are the right ratios in schools? What are the right ratios that fit the student experience that we want to have? Are there different minimums that we, that we can provide now than we couldn't previously? And so the highlighted cells are places where, we've, where we identified potential places where the district could uh, dial up staff in its existing small schools and make some changes to ratios. This example, uh, is creates about an $8 million offset to that $10 million savings in the prior slide. But ultimately, it would be the work of a district leadership to determine the exact rule for allocating uh, staffing to the rest of the school portfolio. Just to say a little bit more on capital here, um, as I said, there's three different parts of the capital uh, footprint here um, in terms of the impact here, additional investment, cost avoidance, and unchanged investments. You can see examples of those uh, in this, in the middle column. These are examples, not the full list of things. Uh, this is just, uh, just illustrative. Um, in this analysis, we've uh, hewed pretty closely to the district's cost estimates. We've gone building by building with the PPS team to get building specific estimates, which we've aggregated into these categories. Um, and as I know you know, uh, your outstanding need for capital investment exceeds your short-term borrowing authority, as is the case in many large systems. So it may be semantics, but we, we do think that there's, um, 
the, the impact here is technically a reduction of 50 million in the outstanding need, not 50 million in savings. And there would be an exercise that the team would need to do to understand the, the rate of borrowing and how that would change to, Im to determine whether, how and whether the, the debt service payments ongoing each year uh, would be impacted. So that's work that would be forthcoming as part of the implementation plan uh, for this. But overall, operating capital, uh, we think that our proposal strikes a reasonable balance between fiscal stewardship and making investments in student experience. So Angela's going to close to talk about implementation. Yes, I'm going to talk about implementation. We're almost done, y'all. I'm about to meet my 90-minute uh, time. Okay, so let's talk about implementation because you're probably wondering how will this be staged, what will be done when, all of that. So let's talk about it. So I propose that you get the majority of the work done in three years. Um, in the first year, it'll be kind of like a transition year. It'll be a chance to do, to start major renovations um, and to also do some minor ones. So it's gonna be important to sort of phase this out. So you're doing a few big, some big projects, some mini projects each year to get it all done. So what we're recommending is that the change in the magnet status begin um, if the board approves the plan that the change would happen this year for those magnet, the magnet status, that they would not be taking in new students um, and that they would adjust the application period um, so that the magnet status would change. Um, again, we wanna phase in a few schools of both minor and major repairs, beginning some of those, some of those can happen now. Um, year two is when you would see, or uh, yeah, so I'm counting this year as year one, important to, to note in this little graphic. Year two would be next school year. Um, so the grade alignment, I believe can begin for most, if not all, schools um, as soon as next year. Um, you're gonna see a rollout in a moment. Um, there's a few that might have to wait, but for the majority, it's important because it's all interconnected. It's all interdependent. Um, new and consolidation, uh, school uh, consolidations would happen um, and there would be additional major sort of renovation projects kind of kicked off. So I wanna share sort of that, all of that in terms of like sort of how things are kind of staged and then year three, some of those brand new buildings would open, et cetera. Year four, it's more like a sustainability year um, and then you could also focus on your teacher centers at that point. But the majority of school changes would happen in about three years. So this timeline provides a multi-phased approach, prioritizing your major renovation projects, your grade changes, and organizational wide supports focusing on long-term success. So I'm gonna show you over the next few slides how we propose the phasing for this implementation. Again, I wanna stress that this is subject to deeper analysis and coordination with several internal administration and executive leaders. Your operations, your finance, accountability, and HR teams will need to work together to verify the feasibility of this part of, this part of the plan um, because it requires coordination. And additional planning is required to ensure coordination and alignment of all these major or many projects um, that are phase, phasing the work. So let's take a look at the feeder around Perry. Um, on the screen, you'll just know there's a couple of different, um, we have spring, summer, fall, spring, summer, fall. Some of this work happens in fall 2027, and in that case, you got a little note at the bottom because we wanted to make sure that you could see it and read it. Um, you can see in each of those boxes when things happen for that particular school or location. So again, Perry, there's no changes, Manchester, the current Manchester would close, and then many, uh, major renovations would begin, okay? 
Um, and so they need that space, they gotta get in there, there's a lot of work that has to happen, and then you can see when it comes online. It wouldn't come online until fall 2026. King, um, again, we're looking at potentially using swing space there, a temporary space or a temporary 6-8. So you could see that um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't actually close because those students would go to the new, um, the new Manchester. So there's a little bit of phasing that has to happen. Um, but removing of the K-5 could happen as early as the spring of this year, again, again, after the board decides. Um, you can see when schools close and when temporary spaces would open on this. And then also you can see when educational improvements are being made and when building improvements are being made. And then, um, so each of these has a phasing plan. I'm not gonna obviously spend a great deal of time going through here, but we have sort of mapped out, if you will, for each of the feeders proposed phasing plan for each of the feeders when the K-5 would close, when the other grades would open, and when those major or minor renovations would be happening. I think this helps to also see where those special locations or services also would move into various spaces um, across the various um, feeders. So again, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time here because um, I wanna be able to get to questions, but we've mapped out for each of the feeders as well as the other sites, the proposed sort of phasing plan, but again, would need to be reviewed. In my last few minutes, I just wanna share a few things about some key considerations or what I'm calling enabling conditions that the district really, I would like, would like to take advisement. Um, because we know that doing this type of work around any sort of portfolio changes is really hard. But I think with a few changes, it could be easier for the future. So one of the things that we believe is important for the future is to consider reviewing and updating your policies and practices to align with the vision, with this vision, um, and all the recommendations contained within those proposals. So there's some things right now, given what we propose, there's some incongruence, some things that don't quite align, and they would need to be fixed if you adopt this proposal. Um, you'll need to review your district choice policies and practices um, for open enrollment to align with recommendations in this proposal. Because right now, um, open seats are kind of, um, uh, um, schools have autonomy in terms of opening up seats. So it'll be important to standardize this process across the district and to have central management of open enrollment seats especially now that we've added these neighborhood schools um, and neighborhood magnets. You'll need to change the application process and, and policy and, and process for magnet schools. So you'll need to standardize your magnet process. So you'll have to standardize your open enrollment and you'll have to standardize your magnet application um, and criteria. And I, I talked about that earlier. And then lastly, for a district who's gone through a lot, I think it's important to consider adding a policy, a board policy, to review possible school changes or school consolidations as kind of like a flag. You would implement a school board policy that automatically reviews schools when certain conditions are met. So this way, um, it doesn't have to be, you know, the whim of the board or the whim of the administration. To, to close a school, but it would allow for transparency and communication when a school is had several years of declining enrollment um, and it, or changes you know, in their enrollment and would help to sort of create a flag to say this school you know, um, may need to undergo some review or some changes in the future. And so that would um, kind of create a sort of a flag to sort of communicate and be transparent. 
Lastly, all this plan requires is implementation and dedicated transition team. Um, and so building out a cross-functional team to develop the detailed plans to go alongside all of the things that we talked about will need to occur and to support a number of areas. And so um, it is including but not limited to all of the things that are on the screen. Um, so having a, a central team to really focus in on this work will be important. PPS was built long ago. Now's the time to build for the future. On behalf of ERS, um, our entire organization, I want to thank you for the opportunity to work with Pittsburgh Public Schools. I've spent um, my entire summer and a part of my fall um, in PPS on the ground. Um, I have been to more than several of your schools. Um, I've been to 20 or so meetings and it has been a true pleasure to work with so many hardworking families and students um, who are truly committed to the vision of this district and to improve the educational experience for all. So um, I just wanna thank you at this time. I will take questions from the board and I did it in 90 minutes. And we thank you for that. So thank you very much for your presentation. Um, board members, do we have questions? Okay, we'll start for Ms. Silk. Thank you so much for, for all of that and for getting it that many slides in, in in 90 minutes. I'm gonna do my questions in order of the slides and I'll try to name the, the slide number um, in case that's helpful for the general public as well. Um, starting with um, slide 10, when you're sharing, um, when you're kind of summarizing um, support and opposition and then the common ground. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, because I didn't see it in the in the appendix slides, mm -hmm. if you could share um, which data sources support those high-level findings and also any descriptive statistics for these data. Um, and if not right now here in this moment, if, if there's like, if there's coded data that, that we could see in addition to the appendix, that would be super helpful. Yeah, so many of those things came out of the uh, feedback by feeder. Um, so there is a data slide, um, let me see, in this version of the appendix, let me see. Um, so we can definitely get to it later, but there is a section where we go by each feeder and there's all the qualitative data to go along with it. And so uh, let me uh, see if I can flip to. So we have all the feed feedback by feeder um, and all of the feedback by parent or be by stakeholder group. So you'll see a set of slides in the appendix somewhere um, that looks like this. So there are so for each of those regional meetings, we have the qualitative data behind each of the, of the um, behind each of the those regional meetings. Families also, um, besides the qualitative, they put it into a survey, yeah. and so the output of that survey is located here. And so we don't have all the qualitatives like saved, obviously, in the because it would make this really big. Right. But behind each of these feeders is all the qualitative data that supports this. Remember, we gave everybody a survey while we were there. And so there was both questions that people could at, um, answer, um, which gives you some of the data that's up here, but they also had um, qualitative feedback that they also could just type in. Right. Yeah. So just as an example, so we could have a, a, a more comprehensive understanding of what the support looks like around the common ground. So 
so um, a finding that the teacher center concept was well received. Yeah, so that it, you can that, see right here. We asked that question in each of the feeders. So Wh which of the following it's upcoming separated changes by do you meaning. exactly mm -hmm. do you anticipate will be okay. the most important for the district to implement? Mm -hmm. Every single regional meeting we had, people chose that that is one of the most important changes that needed to be implemented. Mm -hmm. And then we also have the qualitative written feedback that aligns also with their survey. So that data is, is reported out, distributed by meeting is what we have access to. Okay, thank you. Now also, we left it open, because mm -hmm. you know some people had access yeah. issues in the building. Yes. So they could have completed it after the meeting. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that they had to complete it during the meeting, but these were, all these surveys were also online on the website. Yes. Understood. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, for um, slide 16, um, around magnet schools um, and, and kind of reconfiguration, can you, uh, I think I know what you mean by this, but can you just for, for, for clarity um, define what you mean by a thematic K-5 school? Yes, so many um, folks, uh, they have a specialty, and the specialty is usually around a, it can be a theme um, or it can be a curricular focus. And so a theme might be considered like a STEAM school or an mm -hmm. art school, um, a, a language immersion also could be considered a theme, but there also could be a curricula, because you know, STEAM, mm -hmm. uh, STEAM or STEM. Um, there's curricula that can also go with it. So not only can you be a, a thematic school focused on STEAM, but you can also have curricula aligned to support that particular theme. Okay, thank you so much. And, and just an additional clarification, um, that is, um, those are all explanations in, an, in a neighborhood school model, right? On that slide where you use the language of thematic K-5 school. Those are neighborhood schools and not magnet schools. You have some magnet schools that have themes. Okay. So it could be both. It could be both. Yes. Right. So it's like a, it's a general. Yes. Thing. So any school. And that's so why I either. had the little that Venn. That's the Venn diagram. That's why the Venn diagram. Got you. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Could be both. Um, when, when you are talking about the rationale around magnet schools on slide 19 and talk about K-5 and K-8 magnet schools typically have less diversity, can you um, unpack in which way those are less diverse, socioeconomic status, racial diversity, English language learners, all of the above? All of the above. All of the above. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but we did um, sort of do mm -hmm. a, it's all of the above, but we did also look because the original um, design of magnet programs mm -hmm. was to integrate schools <laughs> racially. So we also looked at the racial makeup of many schools as well. Thank you. Um, also with magnet schools, um, in the slide you include that many of the elementary magnet programs are not achieving its attended program design outcomes. Yep. Does this mean that there's a lack of implementation fidelity? Um, and if so, how has that been communicated to date to those families? Yes, so I, um, I know that the designation of magnet schools was created long ago. Yeah. And through our interview process and talking with a number of folks, um, <laughs> there, there were definite feedback that in some cases that the people were confused on what the programming was. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in some instances, I believe that the fidelity, like you said, the fidelity of the true program and making sure that it's like really robust and, and really um, fully delivering on all of those things around a particular specialized area, um, that there's inconsistencies in that fidelity. Yeah, thank you. And on that last bullet on that slide, could you share a little bit more about how the demands have shifted um, 
read since the original design and implementation of the elementary magnets, student needs and demands have shifted? Yeah, so it, that bullet was really referring to this and then going back to the demand across the various schools. Okay. Um, and maybe it's an assumption, but you've got some schools that had to keep their application open just to get um, applicants um, for that particular location. Um, and so I don't, I, I think this is an opportunity for the district to sort of align on the programs that they feel um, best sort of align with where the district is now and where that school community is now. Um, and so it's an opportunity, I think, to sort of shore up, if you will, the, the programs. Thank you. Um, so my next question is about the, the, the grade reconfiguration, understanding that the, that the, the K5, 6, 8, 9, 12 recommendation initially came from district leadership that you carried forward into your, into your um, proposal here. Um, after attending numerous community meetings as well, lots of folks um, have been asking um, which research is supporting, um, in addition to the, the, the professional recommendations of leadership and, and yours as well, what research backs up that, that configuration as being um, um, best for, for student outcomes? There's um, a variety of research on both sides of this in terms of the grade configuration um, either way. I will say there's a lot of inconsistencies in how educational services are delivered to students when you've got a variety of models that students, um, that you have within your portfolio of schools. Here in PPS. Here in PPS. Yeah. And so when you've got five and six different models, mm -hmm. um, it makes it hard to make sure that you've got that consistency across the board for your students. The second thing I would say is having different grade configurations, so one in terms of that consistency and making sure that there's support for schools um, is challenging, but the other thing that's important to note here is that um, having really tiny middle schools is very problematic to make sure that they are getting the academic programs and courses that they need. And so having um, very few students having access to algebra and some of those higher level math and science courses becomes problematic then at the high school level to make sure that they have the prerequisite learning that they need. Mm -hmm. You have students in this district that aren't taking algebra or the higher level math inside the district, they're taking it other places. Not all students have that access. Mm -hmm. So this is about supporting and ensuring equity and ensuring that, that all students have the academic foundations that they need. And Having a whole bunch of tiny middle schools is not going to get you there. So this really does, independent of the administration's initial facilities utilization plan, um, outside of that, in order to get you to where you need to be to be able to offer these courses, you're going to have to have larger middle schools. Thank you. Um, Moving to the regional ESL sites, and this is slide 24. Um, and I was wondering just in general, um, what, um, well, actually, I'm just gonna read this. So in, in the slide, um, it says, provides access to ESL services closer to home for a growing number of English learners. And so uh, it would be great to be able to see some of that geocoded data of where, like where, where are those families currently living, and in which neighborhoods, and where are which neighborhoods are we seeing an increase um, in our, with our immigrant families? Being able to see that visually would be super helpful. Um, 
and I, I have not seen that to date. We have the data, which is why you see the okay. locations of the ESL um, areas, regional centers mm -hmm. placed throughout yeah. um, in the various feeders. We didn't just haphazardly pick those locations. Of we course. picked it based off of that geocoded data. So we have the information. Yes. yes, it would be helpful to also be able to, to see that as decision makers and for the public to be able to see not just where you're recommending that we put them, but also to have a sense of where our changing population is um, across our district. Um, thank you. Um, the, for, um, this is in slide 29, repurpose available building space to support community partnerships and professional learning. Um, can you speak a little bit to um, what, the, what the space and design needs are for professional learning for, for PPS staff? I can't speak okay. to, I can't speak to that, but what I can speak to is that through the conversations with district leaders, school principals, um, and assistant principals, um, that they really raised this as an important issue um, around making sure that there was dedicated professional learning and, and access, um, and that, that it is often challenging now. And so um, I can speak to that part um, in terms helpful. of the need. Yeah, and yeah, they Pablo raised it. It, came it was raised from the both. Staff. Yes, and um, also within the, we also did early on a high level survey with teachers and with teachers as well, um, in terms of wanting to have support. Okay, thank you. I am skipping these um, for. Um, I know that this is this is in the appendix, but because some of this was part of the, our, our public meeting tonight, can you um, can you just unpack for for the public what the um, what the educational adequacy index is? Because I think on the slide it just read EAI, um, and who developed that? This was which on side are you referring I think it was to? On thirty six. In the, oh, on the, um, oh. Okay, I got you. <coughs> yeah, it's, it's so referenced, some of this, it's referenced throughout, I think some Yeah, so some of, and I have a rationale. terms. Yeah. Yes, I have a terms and um, a term sheet, a terminology sheet that yes. goes along with this, which is located in the appendix. Mm -hmm. Um, so yes, yeah, so some of this data we, is, is district data um, that we highlighted in terms of just available data that we utilized in, throughout this process. Let me see if I can figure out where in the appendix it is. But yes, there's a term sheet to 150. So for the viewing public, I know that you'll have access to these slides afterwards, but on 150, for each of the profile slides, there are terms, and what we've done is we've included those key terms and definitions for each, uh, each school change and um, some of the detailed information that is located on the slide can be found in the key terms and definitions highlighted on page 150 within the appendix. Um, so you were referring to the Educational Adequacy Index and um, the FCI, both of these um, were provided um, for the district in terms of where, where schools were, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for lifting that up in this, um, in this public space um, um, in addition to having it in the appendix which is also available to the public. Um, uh, I had a question about community school designation in the in, in the proposal. Um, start the first one, I believe, is on slide forty six with with Carmel. And I was just wondering how if you could um, share a little bit more about your methodology for how you determined 
which schools to designate or to, to propose being new community schools. Okay, I wanna refer to that slide, so. Of course. Um, we did not, I think that will be up to the purview of the district, okay. however, let me just say the, the one school that we really feel, well, there's two actually, that I think would be a really good um, sources or places for the community school designation um, or focus, I'll call it a focus versus a designation because um, I think that schools in general are places for um, the community to support is actually the Northview building. Um, Per, um, I think that's an excellent opportunity to partner with um, folks within the community um, to provide supports to families in that area. So definitely um, Northview, I think that needs to be taken into serious consideration as a part of building that building out. Um, and then the other area that is kind of isolated would be Mifflin. Um, I think that could be another area uh, for opportunity for partnering with the community. Thank you. Mr. Dean. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you. Uh, this was a tremendous amount of work. Uh, and uh, we appreciate it. Uh, I have three questions. Uh, one, the first is our dilemma here in Pittsburgh is not just logistical. It's an academic shortcoming in certain areas and in certain communities and certain schools. I am more concerned about the academic needs of our students than I am how long is the bus ride, how many seats are available in the classroom, not to suggest that those things aren't important, but my priorities are our mission of educating children at a high level. I have raised that point uh, almost every time I've had an opportunity but it seems to fall on deaf ears. And it is certainly not included in the shape of this proposal. Um, I wonder what, you, what the discussion was within ERS. Um, about how to treat that subject area and what, what your recommendations are uh, for us going forward. Thank you um, for that question and it was really at the, it was um, one of the important factors to what we considered, trying to improve overall um, the overall academic outcomes for students. Um, and many of our recommendations are rooted in trying to provide stability um, in, in the midst of major school change and trying to improve the quality of the academic student experience. Um, so I'm trying to find a slide. This is not all things, but I want to talk about what's on this slide, and I also want to go back to another slide. Um, we were thinking about student outcomes and how to improve the student experience 
I think one of the important things that needs to be taken into consideration is helping to support your teachers and providing stronger professional learning structures um, for improved classroom instruction. Also, to provide more manageable workloads for your teachers. That helps to support and teacher retention. Um, expanded coursework and resources at schools and serving greater numbers of students um, across all your social de uh, demographic data will result, I think, in higher academic um, outcomes. Um, so one, that foundational, you know, creating foundational experiences for your students at the elementary level is really important. They should have access to art, music, PE and world languages at your early, at your early grade levels. That will help to drive um, higher levels of ac academic outcomes and readiness for sec at the secondary levels. Um, so we believe that these changes will do that, but I also wanna go back to uh, earlier on In terms of the academic experience, I want to go back to this slide. Because I think that these things will drive to an improved student experience, improved classroom experience, which will then result in higher academic outcomes for students. Um, so it was a part of our process. And as we were also reviewing some of the final recommendations on school changes, also expanding seats at some really amazing schools. Um, and that will also build um, for improved academic experiences for students. So I think there's multiple ways this plan does that. Um, yeah, you can ask, come on, because he asked both of us. You know, there's one, um, thanks, thanks for, for raising that, because it really, we intended to center on what's going to lead to the best outcomes for kids. Um, one thing that may be intuitive to you all, but we haven't named it explicitly, so let me just, let me just put, put it out. At um, grade level size, as opposed to school level size, as, as opposed to school size, is a very important driver of student experience and teacher experience. Let me say a little bit about why. Um, one of the things that when you've got one or two classrooms at the elementary level, your opportunities for, for providing inclusive settings for special ed kids uh, can be very limited. When you've got one or two, you don't really have teacher teams. You have uh, who, who share content. You've got to be very flexible in terms of how you have teachers actually collaborate. There's a whole body of research around teacher teaming and professional learning that talks about teacher teams and collaborative planning as a really big important driver of improvement in instruction, opportunities for flexible grouping, individualized attention, small group instruction across, even across classrooms sometimes. When you've got a singleton in a grade level, you really can't do that. Imagine a novice teacher who you are the one second grade teacher in your school and it's your first year teaching. Imagine what that experience could be if you had three other second grade teachers who were helping you every week uh, to, get your, to get your lessons uh, done all that. So teacher teaming and grade level size, really important uh, part of the thinking behind a lot of what's here in the shift to K-5 and 6-8. I know as former middle, as middle school teachers, if you are the math teacher, you are teaching sixth, seventh, and eighth grade math uh, because that's, like, that's your content or you're, or you're teaching interdisciplinary, multiple, multiple subjects, really challenging load, really hard to provide great instruction. If you are the sixth grade math teacher, you've got one, you've got one prep for four, if you structure correctly, four periods. That's an opportunity to really go deep on that content and provide significantly more precise instruction 
uh, than when you have every day having to do three different lesson plans for three different grade levels. So that was a, lo a lot of the thinking behind that grade level size, distinct from school size as part of the logic for why we ended up where we ended up. Thank you. <clears throat> Those things may happen, um, but I would appreciate the, the, the things that need to happen to realize that those changes and improvements be brought to the surface so that they can be understood and believed and acted upon. Um, my second question has to do with uh, our process. Your, your recommendations uh, actually are to the superintendent, uh, not so much directly to the board. The board has to engage among its members uh, and decide what parts of this total package we buy we we, understand, we agree with and adopt, and which parts we don't. Uh, and we rely on the superintendent and his recommendations, uh, ultimately. Uh, and I wonder if you have some advice or some thoughts about the process between the board and the superintendent that will get us to a final decision. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was gonna say, I, we really defer to this body um, to make a recommendation in terms of um, moving forward um, because I know that there's a process that you guys implemented and that's how we sort of got here. So we would defer to, to both um, uh, the board chair and vice chair education committee uh, lead and the superintendent. Um, so we would have to defer, but happy to, if there's specific questions that we can help to inform. Um, but as far as I know, I get to go home tomorrow. <laughs> Um, my last question has to do with racial implications. Um, the majority of students in this district are African American students. Um, and we are failing to educate those students. Um, and I wonder what, if you have some pages relative to the racial uh, implications of the, uh, the recommendations that you're making. Yes, yeah, so I wanna go back to this slide um, that shows the impact, what we looked at. So I'm gonna go from left to right we looked at the total number of students that would be impacted, um, you know, looking at your entire population of students currently, um, the black bar denotes the percent of students that would be impacted. Now you may wonder, so like how many are in, within that 38%? Like when you look at the total number of students that are economically disadvantaged, what percent of those would be impacted? it's 39%. When you look at non-economically disadvantaged, it's 35%. When you look at SWD, your students with disabilities, it's 42%. Your non-SWD, how many is that? It's 37%. So let's get into, um, and then non, or ELL, 
your English language learners, and then your non-ELL, you can see it's 35 and 38 percent. Now, your, your specific question was around the number of black students. How are they impacted? As you can see on the chart, it's 39 percent. Your number of white students that would be impacted, it's 34 percent. And Asian, 38, and Hispanic, 36. So it's relatively, in terms of impact, number of people touched, number of students impacted, um, it's kind of balanced, you know, across the various demographic groups. Um, historically, we know that your picture of changes and impacts did not look like this. It's a lot greater. It was a lot greater in terms of African American students that were impacted by school changes. And part of the reason why this number is lower than what was originally stated is because we, um, there are less schools that would undergo school changes. So that's why the number is the number that it is. Thank you for your questions. I'll buy that for now. <laughs> Mr. Barker. Thank you, thank you uh, for really uh, taking in consideration um, all of the, the things that folk really didn't want to buy the first time you all came and presented. Um, thank you all for, you know, taking all that time to, you know, rethink and re-strategize and then come back with something that was, as you can tell by these numbers, equal um, across the board, more thoughtful. Um, I just want to go back to slide 18 really quick. I just, just for my sanity, um, I feel like Brashear and Perry are on, on this bar graph twice. You want me to go back to the Brashear slide? No, no, 18. 18, okay. On the choice. Oh, here. So yeah, Perry and and, and Brashear are, are on her twice. So I don't know if like yeah, they have different programs. Okay, and so, so like um, one of these is the ROTC. That low number mm -hmm. is Brashear ROTC magnet. Okay. Uh, Perry, Perry or ROTC. Perry's okay. ROTC magnet, and then that's why you the other Perry wherever it is. Okay. Yeah. So one of these is is the ROTC. Okay. I have my team in the back that can probably give me that data. Um, and send it to me so I can tell you exactly which pr program. But some of these high schools have multiple magnets, and th that's what it's showing, Thanks. the applications for that particular magnet. Now, we put all programs together for CAPA because, um, because it was just easier to sort of present that way. Mm -hmm. um, but even when you pull that data apart in terms of Obama and CAPA, the bars look different depending on the program. Okay. So they might have a ton of people who apply for dance, but then like nobody applies for poetry. I'm making stuff up, but okay. I, I'm just trying to give you an example. <laughs> okay, uh, so thank you for that clarity. Um, thank you to Yael for asking all the questions, um, which was amazing. Uh, so the, the uh, next thing I need to know for clarity for, for everyone you know, because a lot of people are quick to pour the fire alarm on what's being reported out. Um, do you all already have the data, the numbers in regards to um, all of the folk that would then be going to uh, Norfew that will be leaving Pittsburgh King? Because a lot of folk don't realize, because you're speaking to a former uh, Norfew Accelerated Learning Academy parent, that a lot of the actual folk that were at Pittsburgh King came from the North Northview neighbor, neighborhood, and, and now you all are proposing that uh, King shut down, and then the families go up to Northview, um, as well as the uh, folk that live in Northview now, which is the Somali Bantu. Um, so my question is, um, of course, uh, we want the numbers uh, to be clear yeah. in regards to uh, where the majority of the students 
uh, reside that go to Pittsburgh King, yep. uh, but also what is going to happen in regards to transportation. Uh, being as though you are closing uh, Spring Hill, yes, uh, as, as, um, as it is a, a K-5 to school, will they go to uh, Northview or will they come down to um, Allegheny? And um, and the last thing I want to know in regards to that is um, the Mexican War Streets, as well as because um, these are neighborhoods mm -hmm. that Pittsburgh King uh, currently, um, you know, uh, receive their their families. Mm -hmm. uh, nor, uh, the Mexican War Streets, as well as the Fanview neighborhood, uh, will they then go to? Um, Allegheny Traditional, or will they be going um, to up to Northview. Uh, Northview? Okay, I can't speak to, remember, let's go back to my butter knife. Um, I can't speak to the exact neighborhoods because, one, you have some neighborhoods that are like kind of carved in to certain places and some that are carved out in others. And um, we think it's important that the district take a really close eye or really close detail on using that exacto knife or a really sharp knife to be really precise. You don't want folks from the outside coming in and making decisions about streets. Y'all already know I'm not from here, so me making a decision about what street the cut should be on, it really needs to be someone who is from the area. Um, and knows where some of those hills are, where people park on both sides of the street so that you can get a bus up. Um, so, but your question, so here are some of our assumptions on this in the appendix, you'll see our recommendations around changes to the attendance zone. Again, this is the butter knife approach, but we said that there's some of your six, eight would shift uh, would shift to the new Manchester. So that's pretty easy, right? What the new building um, at that man middle school at that Manchester site. Now your northeast section of the zone would uh, shift to Northview. So you know the area better than I do, but um, and so it's approximately 200 students would be rezoned back to Northview. Um, the rest of the attendant zone would shift about 300 students to Allegheny. So again, you'll want your demographer to really go in precisely to make that cut, but you can see where we made the estimates. Again, we used the geocoded data. We could see where all the kids live. Um, and we were like, okay, we need approximately 200 to go here, 300 to go here, they will fit here, they will fit here. Um, but again, we didn't make it precise. Okay, thank you for that. Two more questions and I'm, and I'm done. Uh, one, uh, when you're saying neighborhood magnet, that doesn't mean that you have to live in that neighborhood in order to go to the magnet, correct? No, so the change for this would be you would guarantee, you would guarantee a seat, and so again, this goes, changes to the application process, but anybody who lives in that neighborhood would not need to, would not need to apply they would have a seat waiting for them. Okay. For the few seats that are left, it's probably more than a few, depending on which program we're talking about, but anyone could then apply for those neighborhood seats. Okay. I mean, remainder within that magnet. Okay. So we wanna make sure that the kids that are surrounding that neighborhood have a seat. Last question, I'm jumping back to Pittsburgh King. Uh, okay. One of the things that uh, was said is that there was a lot, a huge report on safety. Yes. Um, are they referring to what is out in the, you know, in the, the park? outside. Yeah, the outside. Yes, there was a lot about just non-PPS students, families, staff, mm -hmm. but a, other adults coming on the property. Um, and either sleeping on the property or um, doing other illegal activities. Okay. I just want to say for, for clarity, uh, they probably have one of the strongest, if not the strongest lockdown um, because they can lock down their porches, which no one gains access to their actual building. 
Um, so I just want to put that out there because, again, King is a bad rap for this, that, and the third. Yeah. Um, but if I was in the lockdown situation, I'd rather be at a Pittsburgh King than some of these other buildings because you can't gain access uh, to, you know, their, their main doors. Yeah. Um, if, they're, if their porches are locked down. Also, whenever they're um, out there, if you're doing any events, uh, their porches are closed in. Kids can play um, if it rains, uh, so on and so forth. So I just want to make sure that we all know that because King does get a bad rap for not having yeah. good things going on, and they do have some great things going on in that building. They have some great things going on in the building. Thank yeah. you. Ms. Talaferro. Thank you, Dr. Reed, um, and thank you, um, Dr. King-Smith, for your presentation and for you viewers as well. Sorry, I forgot your name. Mr. Travers. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, so I, okay, a couple questions and then some thoughts. Um, so I'm going to start with the King comment that um, Director Barker just made because it was on my list. I've also heard in my north side, especially from my north side, um, and um, like that central Lawrenceville um, area um, families about the safety and security issues. And I think um, the question that keeps coming to my mind, and it's not necessarily a question for you to answer, but I'm just going to say it out loud, um, is that um, King is a stone's throw away from Allegheny and somehow um, there are not the same level of safety and concerns at Allegheny as there are at King. Um, so that is a thought that has been sitting with me when we're talking about the potential of closing a building like King, um, which I have seen, you know, the programming and the work that goes into making that school an excellent, um, and for some reason, um, uh, people don't want to send their kids there, and that's concerning to me. Um, so that's something that I think we really want to look at and factor in as we're making any final decisions about this plan. I'll also say that um, those outside factors that people have concerns about are real. That is my neighborhood. I can walk to King, and I can walk to Allegheny from my house. Um, and so those same issues that they are facing are the issues that I face as a resident in the neighborhood, um, so I don't disregard that concern at all. But I think that when I, when I look at issues like that, um, the first thing that comes to mind is that these are factors that are out of our control, but these are the factors that we need to call on and challenge our other um, city officials, city, county, um, and even state to be able to address the issues of drug use in that neighborhood to address the issues of homelessness in that neighborhood because it is a real issue. Those people are people, um, so I will not um, say that or do anything to you know, dehumanize them, but I do think that that's a real problem in that part of the community that I think um, we can't, there might be things that we cannot um, control, uh, things are outside of our, our element but we do have to challenge um, our, our colleagues at the city, state, um, and county level to be able to address those issues so that our students can be safe and that families can feel safe sending, feel good about sending their kids um, to that school or any of the schools in that area. So I wanna stay, start with that. Um, the second thing, um, I think I, the, the biggest issue that I have um, around um, the thoughts and the, what has gone into the decision making and what we have received this evening um, is considering low and declining enrollment schools as the ones that should close first um, or be closed. And what I ask myself, um, and I think I'm asking everybody in this room is what did we miss or how did we fail those schools um, for them to be low enrollment, declining enrollment, and, and maybe even low performing. Um, I don't think that we should have to close a school because not enough people want to send their kids to those schools or not, there's not enough you know, kids to go in those buildings. That should never be a reason why we close a school building. 
I don't think there should be ever a reason that we do, but I'd understand the reality that our district faced and many districts around the country. So it's not, um, it's, it's something that I, I acknowledge, but I have deep concerns about how that is affected. Um, so, I'm saving some of my comments about my district two schools because um, not much has changed from the first draft proposal. So I'll come back to that. But um, the one thing I wanted to mention, I know this has been brought up before, the use of, the use of STEM as a pathway throughout the district um, kind of throws me off because a lot of the schools um, especially two schools in particular, Schiller and Woolslayer in my district, are STEAM schools. Um, and I know that um, Brashear also has a STEAM program. And so I think when we're, we're considering uh, programming and how we put programming in these buildings, um, we need to keep that in mind because I know that I've, I've gotten a lot of comments by constituents about um, the A and the A missing, and that is critical. And I think that the A is important in every school. The arts are important in every school, especially if they're going to feed into the only uh, six, potential 612 school being our performing arts school. I don't know how students would even be able to qualify for a school like that if we exclude the A or that we don't make the arts a priority. Um, in our decision making. And then, um, bear with me guys. I limited my, my pages with questions. So. <laughs> um, so the other thing I wanted to mention is, is Wilkinsburg in this equation. I think that we, um, you know, just talking to some of the Wilkinsburg school board directors, I think we, although they are included because they are West, you know, they're a part of the district, so they would been, have been included in communication to all district um, families. I think we missed uh, an opportunity to directly engage our Wilkinsburg families specifically, um, but I do see that in this proposal they could stand to benefit from, from a lot of these changes. But the one thing I would like to ask for just clarity um, is where um, the Wilkinsburg students, so right now Westinghouse is their feeder school as a 612 school, it's their feeder school. Um, so that's the school that they, or their home school, I guess. Um, but that they can also apply for magnet programming to go other, other places. So with removing the, um, Wilkinsburg also goes to, sixth grade, so their middle school students, sorry if I'm confusing you, their middle school students would just only come to PPS in seventh and eighth grade. So where would they be placed as their home school? Staring. Okay, can you just say that for reference because I don't think that that was clear to, to a lot of people. Okay, let me uh, flip back to Yeah, um, I was trying to find the Westinghouse. Oh, there we go. Wait, that's current. Yeah, so it'd be Starrett. Okay. Yeah, because the um, Westinghouse is shifting from from six twelve to nine twelve, and the middle school for Westinghouse would now be Starrett. Okay, thank you. I just wanted that to be clear, um, to to be said clearly, so that people understand that shift for Wilkinsburg students in that equation. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna dig in a little bit to Montessori because um, it is my understanding that Montessori doesn't need to be a magnet school. Can that be clarified? It does not have to be a magnet school. It could be um, just a, a program. So that is something that um, as a board, as an organization, you all can look at. I will say, as we were contemplating, this is the one place that I think there's, that you could go a different direction. Mm -hmm. um, our direction um, for stabilizing uh, your, your enrollment, it was to uh, give them um, more space 
um, and to grow it because the demand is there. Um, however, by maintaining the magnet status, um, you likely would have more of citywide, you know, uh, citywide attendance like it's similar today. Um, but if you, we also looked at turning it into a neighborhood school or a neighborhood magnet um, at K-5. And what that would mean is they would, if you follow our process, that you would be guaranteeing anybody within that area um, a seat at that school and then whatever sort of remaining would be for citywide or for others. Um, and so you may not have enough space to get the neighborhood and the citywide all in one building. Um, so, but that is an option. Um, thank you. So then that leads to my thought is that maybe we need to consider putting the Montessori in a community that um, could actually benefit from, um, benefit a little bit more from the model of the school. But also it just leads me to be, to, to think that if the Montessori model mm -hmm. um, brings all the people to the yard, um, then why are we not, or maybe we should be considering um, using that model in all K-5 schools and not just be so focused on Montessori. But that could be um, staffing. There might not be enough Montessori educators. Certified, certified teachers. teachers. And their model is very specific, right? It's very specific. Right. And so we, we looked at potentially regional Montessori um, schools um, as a, also another option. We looked at co-locating Montessori or regional um, as an option, but we wanted to see if their demand would continue when you move it to another location. And so maybe if they can uh, demonstrate that demand, then maybe then you roll it out into regional mm -hmm. other regions. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, another question that I have is, so when we look at um, shifting some of these schools, so we're in my district, in District 2, um, we are losing um, Fulton, Woolslayer, uh, a part of Arsenal, so the K-5 part of Arsenal or pre-K-5 of Arsenal, um, Schiller and Spring Hill. That's a big loss for my district. That deeply concerns me. Um, I think it's great to consider opening or reopening the Northview High School. I think that that decision can really benefit the, the population in that community. So I don't um, you know, disregard that at all. But it does concern me still. Now we are talking about a uh, loss of King, uh, Schiller, and Spring Hill. And it still creates a weird um, absence of schools on the north side, which covers multiple neighborhoods. The north, we call it the north side, but it's like 16 to 18 neighbor, different neighborhoods. And it's very spread out. So that's just something again, as we're working through a proposal and what might work um, brings up a level of concern for me. Mm -hmm. um, I understand the passion behind every one of the buildings that I represent and the families um, and the students who attend them. It's gonna be a loss. And I don't think that that's something that we can just take lightly and yeah. just say, well, we need to decrease the amount of schools that we have. Um, so I just want to say that in this space. It's, it's a severe impact um, on my district. And I, I can't support any plan that isn't well thought out enough to be able to make sure that the needs of those families are met, that the programming, I know there's not an attachment to the building per se for Wool Slayer families, but that programming moving and staying accessible to those families is important. Um, so that is something that I want to keep at the forefront of this conversation. I represent a part of the city, but ultimately the decisions that we make affect everybody. But I'm going to ride hard for District 2 and the schools in District 2. And losing five out of the nine schools that I represent is, is, is crazy to me. Um, 
Go ahead. We don't do that. I'm just saying. Um, I just want to say, you're also whenever you're closing down a um, a Spring Hill and a Schiller, you're leaving the early childhood center on the island because there's there's no schools anywhere around that early childhood center. Um, Spring Spring Garden is already um, secluded, and the only support that it had, um, because the way our early childhood centers are set up, there is no principal inside of these centers. So the principals are coming from the, the local school. So Spring Hill principal was technically the principal for Spring Garden. So now you're taking Spring Hill away and now Spring Garden Early Childhood, which is our only early childhood center on the north side, has no support at all around it. Bad enough, there's no buses that run through there um, frequently. Like, So, yeah, that, I mean, I, I totally agree with you, um, Director Devin. Uh, thank you, Director Barker. And I also represent Spring Garden Early Childhood Center. So, again, I share the same um, concerns. Um, the last thought I wanted to share is um, page 70, kind of, we kind of breezed by um, these um, special schools. So I'm just wondering if um, you can just bring clarity. So you mentioned that Oliver Citywide um, would become a full-time emotional support programs location, but I'm not really sure what that means or what that would look like. Um, so I'd like some clarity on that. Um, the online academy is moving to the Roosevelt building, which is in the south of the city and which still south side is where it's currently located. But is, it, is that going to be accessible to students um, who utilize that program? And the online academy building in itself um, also houses like our teen pregnancy program and I know other um, spaces, office spaces are, are, are utilized there. So then what would become of that space um, is what I am wondering. And then the last thing, um, it's probably an unpopular opinion, but I am fully supportive of closing the gifted center and putting gifted programming in every school that's supposed to have it. It works well at Dilworth. Um, um, but I think that the way that we've done gifted programming has excluded a population of students that probably would benefit um, from that programming otherwise. So I'm just gonna say that. Um, and then I'll go back, one more question I forgot to ask was the Dilworth. So Dilworth already is um, like, I don't know if it's at capacity or has spacing. So I know that we would take the magnet status away from it so it could free up seats. But I'm just thinking of the merging of a Fulton, like if Fulton were to go to Dilworth, what that would look like in terms of spacing because I know they're already pressed for spacing. So I don't know if you can add any or shed any light to that as well. Um, so let me talk about Dilworth in a moment. I can't speak to um, your, um, a lead for all of your students with disabilities programming around the Oliver City Y would have to answer specific questions regarding the emotional support programs, um, but um, in terms of finalization. Um, so I, I can't get into the details of that because we were asking more global questions about possible um, location or relocation. Um, regarding the Dilworth, yes, that is, one that in terms of like phasing out of the magnet and the timing of that is gonna be really, really important. Um, and because of the number of students that are currently in the program and the number of students that are in that area. Mm -hmm. um, so turning it into a neighborhood school will have to sort of phase out the magnet um, in order to be able to create space for the neighborhood. Okay. Um, and then my last question, I guess, is to, to us as a board. So th this is a lot of information um, and the bigger presentation, I mean, the bigger 200-page slide deck is even worse. Um, so if there are additional questions, like after this meeting, we'll, what will the space be or how will we be able to, to get those questions answered? And then will those questions be made public? Do you want to answer for them? Yeah. 
I mean, if you have one now, that's great. If not, we need to talk about it offline, but then it needs to just be public what we decide. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know if we have an answer for that now, but I do have thoughts on the process going forward, which might help. But I wanted to save that until we got through all the questions, if that's okay. Silk had other questions. Hi, thank you. Um, and I want to acknowledge that this is taking time and this is important. And thank you for being up there for all of this time. This is intense. Um, uh, I have a set of questions about the East and Central um, slides that you shared, starting with Westinghouse. Um, and I, I believe now with the new recommendations that there might be another high school that falls into this category, but what are your recommendations um, um, given past work for how we offer a full high school program um, at Westinghouse if we know that the enrollment numbers as they currently stand and as the butter knife version of um, um, attendance zones that at least it will start out lower than the recommended minimum enrollment. So do you have recommendations for how um, how other districts have addressed that, that scenario. Um, I'll ask Jonathan if you want to speak to this um, because I've been doing a lot of talking. Um, but I will say that I think this is an opportunity to assess your pathways across all your high schools um, and programming in your high schools. And so both for your CTAE uh, offerings as well as your um, pathways or specialized uh, programs that this is an opportunity to kind of like take an inventory of where all the stuff is and and determine the demand or the interest for those particular things now's the time that you could sunset things that students aren't really interested in um, to bring stuff on that kids really want to learn more about or uh, or or to take um, so I think this is a is an opportunity to kind of look at the collective and um, see what all pathways are available as well as your CTAE programs and to build them out um, based off of you know the area in the each each high school and that can create an attraction mm -hmm. for students um, to, to attend those particular pathways or sections. Anything? No? That's what you would say. Okay. You got a solid <laughs> nod from behind you. Um, just thank you for that. Um, my next question is about the, the Colfax zone, because um, it wasn't clear to me, based on what was written on the slides and addition what I think I heard you say. Let's go Are down. you, I think it's 58. Are you suggesting? I'm going to go on down here to the detailed where okay, you can perfect. see the actual zone recommendations because okay. Colfax um, has a lot of kids. Yes, and so the, the and specific the, clarifying question, the, the, the kind of the neighborhood question that I have yep. was are you suggesting in this proposal um, that students in the northern section of the current Colfax zone would attend Liberty and then jump back into the Alder Day feeder pattern? Because in slide 54, Liberty students are part of the Obama feeder pattern. So I was, yeah. I was not understanding the recommendation. Okay, so this slide on 100 and, page 179. So this is of the appendix. This is in the appendix. For folks yeah. watching at home. This has all of the sort of assumptions around the, the, the attendance zone changes. And so in this far right column, not the far, the furthest right, but the one before that, it shows what our notes were on what we were assuming. So, um, so the current K-8, or the 6-8 Colfax, you may wonder where are the kids coming to fill the 6-8? Well, they're coming from um, your attendance zone. Uh, 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 you would add the existing Mifflin 6-8 zone. You would add the existing 6-8 zone, uh, Greenfield zone. They would receive a portion of current students in the Starrett attendance zone. 
There would be some shifts in the section of the attendant zone um, around Greenfield. Um, and Dale would also have some shifts and there's a little bit of shift around in, in terms of um, uh, the section around the Northwest section for Liberty. So there are lots of new cuts that will need to be made. The current Colfax as a K-8 is 719 right now. With these assumptions around these changes, we're looking at um, middle school around 660, um, which is that modeled mm -hmm. enrollment over there. Now, um, so that helps you to sort of understand like sort of what our assumptions were, but I know there are some, um, like I said, some of that detail work that would need to take place in terms of exactly where those cuts would be. Yeah, um, and, and then I, here you can see the elementary where, um, like, so if, if um, I'm a Colfax parent and I'm wondering, like, w would I be likely zoned to Greenfield? Um, you can see our assumptions to the right um, uh, and which students would need to, to sort of shift um, for, the, for, for Greenfield. So you can kind of see our assumptions. I'm, I'm having trouble decoding this information. So can you give me as an example, if I am a family currently living near the Colfax building and I'm wondering where I would go to elementary school, where would I go in this model? So again, this sort of has some sort of some of our baseline assumptions. What we can do is we can sort of follow up with you regarding okay. that particular question. Okay. Yeah. Um, that would be helpful. Um, uh, so I, then I have uh, some around the Montessori program. Um, can you, do you have um, handy the current number of seats available at the Friendship Building versus how many would be available if the program moved to Linden? One moment. Yeah, okay, thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll look that up. That's excellent. I'm gonna move on to the next question while you look that okay, up. Okay, so that? front number, the total, thank you, because, yes, thank you, because I can't see. You might need to look at it, because I have. Okay, they're working on it. Okay, perfect, thank you so much. Um, while they're doing that, would you um, share, um, I, I, this has been brought up um, um, to some degree, can you share the location decision? Oh, you have it already? No, okay. I have oh. something else. I wanted to just follow up regarding Please. the um, Liberty question. Thank you. Um, that some students currently in the Colfax zone would attend Liberty based off of our assumptions and so we modeled in those mm -hmm. assumptions that the new Liberty Zone would be part of the Obama feeder. So there are some in there that would be a part of that Obama feeder. Okay. And the district would need to, like I said, because of that, that, that gray box on that one slide, yes. there are some places that the fine tuning and the demographer work would have to happen. Okay. So just to say that back for clarity. Yep. Again, with the idea that more precise attendance zone work needs to be done by district leadership. Yes. But that what you are suggesting, what you are recommending is that in the current, um, that, that families that are currently attending Colfax K-8, that those elementary school students, depending on where you live, would either go to one of the three elementary schools that are part of the Alderdice feeder pattern and that some you're recommending some would might go to Liberty, be going to Liberty, go which to is Liberty, part of the Obama. Which is part of the Obama feeder pattern. Yes. And that we as a board would look to district leadership for specific recommendations. Yes. That's the understanding. Yes. Okay. Because part of the problem, if you can see on the slide, um, there's a whole lot of kids like in that area. Mm -hmm. And so in order to be able to really make sure we've got some balanced schools and enough seats for kids, there had to be, we had to go in and like I said, use the butter knife to sort of 
align right. things. But I think, again, this is an opportunity for the district mm -hmm. because there are some little neighborhoods <laughs> that are sort of carved out, oddly placed in odd zones yeah. that don't quite add up, that this is a chance to also do some of that alignment work. Right. And then my next set of questions is around the, the have additional questions about the, the Montessori program because there is a school building in that area where there are a lot of elementary school families. So that Linden building, um, and so both the fact that there are a lot of families and there is an available building there, and as has already been raised, this idea that if Montessori is such an in-demand program, why are we putting it in a neighborhood um, in a neighborhood like Squirrel Hill versus putting it in an under a historically underserved community and prioritizing it as a neighborhood magnet. Can you share the rationale for that specific location for Montessori versus making it a traditional neighborhood school? So we did, like I said, we, we really looked at a number of different ways to address the Montessori it can go, it can go in some other places. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that, the Montessori of all of them, I think that is the one, and I think I noted this before mm -hmm. in, in some of our um, sessions, but it can, th there's different ways that you may wanna think about the Montessori. And I th think um, we offered a recommendation, mm -hmm. but know that there are probably five other variations. And so um, that may be one that you decide to fine tune. Great, thank you so much. And in, in thinking about um, not using the friendship building as a school, if that is- It can't be. It, it, you're saying it can't the be. The operations staff have told us that it has okay. to. Okay. Yes. Um, the recommendation was about community groups using using that building. Are there community groups that have that have communicated an interest, or was that's more I'm not like aware a brainstorm that, idea? That okay. would be something that the district would need to okay. uh, right. inform. Thank you. Um, and then I also had some questions about the the gifted program. Um, can you unpack the rationale? for redistributing the program to each site versus having it in a central building for our broader community? It's important for access um, in terms of having the opportunity for black and brown students to be have access to gifted programming and in order to be in the gifted program need to have tested, right? And so having more staff members available in all of your schools that have the um, certification um, and the training to be able to embed it within your program like what's happening now at Dilworth. I think that your numbers around the numbers of students that are identified as gifted could go up dramatically um, by expanding the opportunity for the gifted um, uh, programming to be at more locations um, instead of having to get on a bus and go to an offsite location um, that similar to your program for um, exceptionalities, that gifted um, is an exceptionality too. And their needs need to be served. And more students need to have opportunity access for gifted support services. Agreed and thank you. And is the idea that the redistribution of staff with this reconfiguration would support those additional, those specialized programs? Uh, are you talking about specialized programming now for, away from giftedness? No, I meant the, I meant the I meant Really, it's gifted. gifted. I, 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 right, so within. Yeah, the, you'll have to, um, I know that you have a brand new director for um, uh, your gifted programming, and I think this would, again, be an excellent opportunity for that person to um, really design this for your district um, based off of your state um, requirements. Um, but I think, again, that uh, this could be a great opportunity for students and families to be able to have the access to testing, and then once you get through the testing, then access to the services. Thank you. Um, 
On the transportation analysis, are there, um, did you look at existing uh, public transit routes to support the proposed changes for our current students? Uh, you might have to wait. It's like Surrey. Hey, Surrey. <laughs> um, so hold on, let me ask that question because I did not uh, work on that analysis and I don't know if our, our team member back there needs to help us to answer that question. So we'll, okay. we will ask, um, let me get back to your question regard, um, regarding uh, friendship. Okay. Friendship's capacity is 468. Lyndon's capacity is 499. So there's not that much more capacity in the Linden building, um, but that friendship building um, needs to come offline. Uh, so there's a number of operational things that they yeah. need to address. Okay, thank you for that. Did you want me to move on to the next question? While you, yeah, great, thank you. Yeah, and also, um, the driver of the relocation from the Montessori friendship to Linden is um, like, I think you could find another location, um, but that was one of the locations that um, would be available. Mm -hmm. So it could move somewhere else. It checked the boxes in terms of making sure that, um, that it was a, 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 re a decent building for that program to go into. Understood. Understood. Um, under the financial considerations, this was, I mean, I'm, I read this line numerous times and I was just gonna ask for some plain speak for my own sake and maybe for other people as well. Um, this is slide 81. Um, it reads, given typical staff attrition rates and the proposed implementation timeline, any headcount reductions would most likely eliminate vacancies, not filled positions. I just didn't understand what that meant. If you could restate that more plainly, I'd appreciate it. Um, and I'll have Jonathan to come up and answer this because he uh, worked on this piece of the process. But essentially, there are open vacancies usually every year. There's like a certain percent of open vacancies. And so um, what this is, in, is, is looking at is you know, part of those would be assumed in that that in those vacancies that would be remaining every year. So I think what we're saying is that there's not significant um, opportunities here because each year you're going to have a, 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 you know, a number of outstanding vacancies. But I'm going to have Jonathan because I know he worked on it and I need a glass of water. Please. <laughs> our, our analysis suggests that there wouldn't be a need for layoffs if you were going to move forward with this plan. Can you say that one more time? <laughs> Our analysis suggests that there wouldn't be a need for layoffs if you were to move forward with this plan. Thank you so much. Um, because you have vacancies yeah. every year. Yeah. And they would just fill in. OK. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, I think that early childhood is one of the strengths of this district and an opportunity for bringing more people in and, 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 and growing in that way. And it's a focus of your proposal. Um, do you have the numbers on how many seats, like is there a seat change in terms of um, early childhood capacity? Um, one, I think it's pretty neutral. Okay. However, because you are now, um, you've got some, you know, uh, vacant spaces and um, spaces within buildings, you could potentially bring on some additional early childhood um, centers. However, I know there's a, um, the funding for that is separate. Okay. So um, the district would need to look closely at that. Um, but yes, there is space within what we're, we're proposing. But overall, we try to not take any early childhood programs away. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we're at my last question. Where can we find the building by building financial analysis that you mentioned that informed the summary data that you shared this evening? Um, financial? Mm -hmm. Oh, in the capital? So that's Oh, okay. Oh, I know what you're saying. Yeah, we we got lots of data um, from 
the PPS team. Mm -hmm. And so that, um, some of that financial data we have is, um, PPS provided. Um, we then utilize that to do the model that you see within the, Mm -hmm. um, but yes, we got, um, some specifics, uh, money information, financial information for schools. Um, and then also for the viewing public, um, I know I went over school changes at a few to make it within the 90 minutes. Um, however, the school by school look for most schools undergoing a change is located in the appendix. So if you didn't see your school highlighted, that part is in the back. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Petrosky. Oh, wait, before I do, I think um, I got the answer regarding transportation. Um, We did not use public transportation data in the analysis for a few reasons. Most notably um, that the PRT is currently redesigning bus routes, which we were, we've been, we've known about uh, throughout this process. So using the current bus routes would not be accurate representation given that they're in the process of redesigning theirs. Also, students who utilize public transportation are mostly high school students. You realize we're not doing a whole lot with high schools other than um, recommending um, some specialized programming, CTE programming. So the majority of those um, were not significantly impacted by the school changes. So we did use, so if you have a question regarding methodology, we did use Google API to run drive time and distances between a school's current address and students, sorry, students' current address and their school's address of what they would be rezoned to. And so the door-to-door times and distances we ran our proxy for public transit times. Okay. Come on. <laughs> no, um, thank you, uh, Dr. Reed, for the time, and thank you, Dr. King Smith, um, and your whole team, um, for still standing up here. And I don't actually have a lot of questions per se, since other folks on this board have been very thorough, which I appreciate. So I actually just wanted to kind of just give my like bird's eye view of, you know, of what I like and then the the big concerns, which is really more, I think, for the administration, um, you know, and to try and keep it as brief as possible. You know, I really appreciate the parts of this plan of like standardizing this K to five, standardizing this six to eight, making sure that all of our students when they get into our school system, they will have this standard experience no matter where they go. And that I think has been like the biggest part of you know Dr. Walter's mission. It's in our strategic plan. It's been mentioned over and over and over again. And I think that this will help accomplish it. I do share a lot of the concerns that my colleagues have, have raised of like, well, if we're closing these schools and it leaves this little horseshoe shape in the north side and things like that. So um, you know, those are certainly things that, um, you know, this board and this administration will have to discuss that we are not deciding on today. Um, you know, but just speaking from my own personal experience as somebody who went to a K-8 private school that are supposedly having more resources, I didn't have access to music because my family couldn't afford it and it was not something that was offered. There are so many opportunities here, like through this kind of model of standardizing it, and I could even speak to my own family looking in my district going, okay, we have Roosevelt and we have Concord and I want my kid to take music, we're gonna send her to Concord. So like we were already having this disparity and she's not even two yet. Um, And so I think that this, you know, this will level, it makes it so much easier for parents to decide and to not compete with each other and to, to understand that they'll have a level playing field instead of trying to escape um, they're bad schools, and, and, it, and it's very, and I use air quotes so that everybody in the public who's listening, <laughs> uh, you know, but I've had similar concerns from folks in my neighborhood of just like, well, Concord is better. I don't want to send my kid to Arlington. And, and you know, moving the, to this six to eight, you know, speaking of Arlington is like, I've done the safe routes to school with the mayor's office. It's not a safe route to school for K to five. There's hardly sidewalks anywhere, and at least middle schools would have a little bit more understanding and wherewithal of like how to walk to school, but also we'd be transporting 
fewer students that it would actually be easier to bus them. Um, and again, so like, you know, increased opportunities there at that school, because I'm looking at this, like three out of 23 schools offer STEAM in middle school, and that is just so sad. And, and that's exactly, at least I can speak to families in my district, they're like, I need to escape whatever my feeder pattern is because it doesn't have X, Y, Z to get my child ahead. And so even if we, you know, if this administration and this district decides to like, okay, we'll have themes or whatever, at least there's still a baseline that, that as these young people are becoming older people and becoming more of themselves at this middle school age, that is like such a sensitive age too, like they don't have to decide you know, this school is better over the other, and, and maybe we'll still have these little weird pockets of it, but at least you don't have to try and run away from, from your home, you know, from your neighborhood. And I get that there's other programming, there's special needs, there's ESL and all those things, but, you know, even with these ESL centers, I think there's a huge opportunity for, you know, helping those ESL students find themselves in a new country and become who they're going to become, and also helping their parents, because even, at Concord, they're also teaching adults ESL. And so I think that there is huge opportunity here not to just help our students and level that playing field, but level that playing field for our families as well. Um, you know, same with the world language kind of thing, this, this algebra issue that it's, it's just like leveling this playing field is gonna put us at competitive levels too with charter and private schools that p families won't have to decide. They'll have the confidence in the district. That being said, this is not going to be easy. Like we know that that there are cultures at schools and and relationships built and all of these other things. And and I don't want the district to miss out on opportunities. So like if this is approved as is, if this is approved with some changes, but I don't want the district to miss out on opportunities of like, okay, these schools are merging. Let's like have a meet and greet with each other and have these opportunities. I'm sure y'all are thinking about it, but I have to say it. <laughs> and and just having you know. Even as we're talking about like, okay, well, Manchester's gonna need major renovations. Is like, let's include the community on what those renovations look like, especially too, as we're merging these schools and like if Woolslayer with this, with its STEAM program is gonna be merging with, I can't remember off the top of my head. Right, but, but so just, just having that opportunity to be like, here's what I love from Woolslayer, here's what I love from Sunnyside, and just having that opportunity for our community to build our schools and not just this board based on numbers and data, which is all very important, and we need dis, like informed and uh, decisions and database decision making, but there, it, there are real feelings in it, and there, there are real relationships in it, and, and we, we can't forget that. Can I just speak to that real yes. quick? I do think that, that there, again, is an opportunity for schools to come together. Um, I have seen in other districts the use of of committees and design teams to help to build or support the school plan. Um, the other thing I would say that was brought up in this district by your school leaders is giving leaders time to build the school design or the school plan. Mm -hmm. um, bringing constituents together to decide on school colors, to decide on mascot changes, or even the school name, and I don't know what the pro process is in the district, but I think that both naming the school, creating that school culture, um, that it should be collaborative in nature. Yeah, thank you. And so I think my biggest concern, and, and Dr. Walters and I have had numerous conversations even prior to any of this planning coming to fruition, but of already existing vacant buildings. Two are in my district. There's um, Bonaire School and Knoxville School, and I've had continuous questions from residents of both of these neighborhoods. They've gone to city council, they've gone to their state reps and all these things. And so, you know, and what's the, Fort Pitt is the other close, which is not in my district, but it's what in Greenfield, wherever it is. But, Garfield. Garfield, pardon me, it's late. <laughs> but so, you know, so there, are, I'm not saying like, let's reuse these buildings and let's bring them into this and maybe there's opportunity for that too, but but they need to be, and and it's not, ERS's responsibility, I don't think, but they need to be included in what this plan looks like too because right now, like, I can speak to Knoxville and Bonaire as this is blighting the community and we as a district, as we're going through this process, like, while we are helping revitalize some of these neighborhoods with new schools and renovations and state-of-the-art things, we also can't leave spot blight in the neighborhoods as 
buildings are closed or reused. I know some will be reused and things, but you know, again, this isn't just to snap your fingers and, and now the plan is happening. And so I know you guys mentioned like, here's some cost savings because you're not paying utilities. But yeah, we still are and it's not to the same degree, but so right. we still need to maintain those buildings even while they're not in use. And so okay. what I would really love to see you know, and this is my government worker brain, but it's like, this is when we need to start relying on partnerships with the city, with the urban redevelopment authority, with the county, with funders and all these things. I know these conversations are happening, but you know, the, our controller mentioned that we're not following our resolution of working together with the city. And I know that there's like a whole <laughs> thing about that, but there, it's a whole thing, but, but in the spirit of that legislation, now is the time to start to do those things is because it, like this cannot be done alone like we know that we're going to be in a deficit we can only borrow so much money and it's not something that could be done alone so like community awesome we also need money um you know and and i see in my line of work very frequently charter schools come to the ura and we help them develop new buildings and property and things and there is no reason that the public school system can't either um and so you know those relationships need to be built be stronger um, you know because we can't just leave a building empty for a charter school to scoop up like there I know that we have policies that dictate you know how we sell our properties and what that looks like and things but I think that there are still ways to be very intentional um, through partnership of what happens with empty buildings so that they can turn into like housing teacher housing or a community center or, or something else, um, you know, so that it's not just, so that people aren't just begging for it to be demolished like they are in Bonaire. Um, you know, so this is all very, very future thinking, but, but it also isn't because, you know, it's just like the longer that you don't think about something, the worse it gets. And so, you know, again, we're not deciding on anything tonight, but, you know, I'm, you know, generally comfortable with this, but I'm, I'm not entirely comfortable approving something that doesn't have thoughts about what happens to empty properties, not even just as a swing school or, or as a teacher center, because, you know, we saw in this proposed timeline, it could be like three or four years out, and a lot of things can happen in three and four years. Um, so I would really like to see that, and again, not ERS's job at this point, um, they've done a whole lot and enough, but so I would really like to see, even if it's from the administration, not even necessarily through an RFP, but just some sort of timeline for these empty buildings. Um, and so lastly, speaking of teacher centers, and I know there was talk of um, Montessori and where can it go and why can't we do it more and things, and, and I've heard folks ha um, in, in just talking and community meetings and all these things of like, why not regional Montessori? And I think it sounds like a really great idea. And again, I know that folks need to be certified and it's a one to two year process, all this stuff. But I think that, you know, if these teacher centers happen, that that's a really great opportunity for that is if we want to expand a successful program, um, again, three or four years out, but giving people something to look forward to as it's solidified in planning um, it's voted on, stuff like that. Um, I would love to see that as part of conversation um, as we're deciding what we like, don't like, and you know, as we approve or not approve this plan. So that's all. You don't have to say anything. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I am going to ask my um, just 10 questions. No. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, no, I, I just, um, just want to say that I think we have an amazing, op I'm going to pass it to Jean when I'm done. I, we have an amazing opportunity here. Um, we have, um, once we iron out all the details, I think that we will be able to look really carefully about the job that we're doing for kids in our district. And I think we have a great opportunity to improve to improve the quality of school experience for our children. And, I, and I'm also really, um, as much as we've you know, gone back and forth with this particular plan, with the last plan and this plan, I think we're, we're making decisions or we're, um, we're using good criteria 
to make decisions. We've, for so long, we've made decisions based on um, what, what is not necessarily great criteria, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. I absolutely love the proposal about the gifted center. That has been my mantra. I have been saying it, This what we do with gifted education right now is what school districts stopped doing decades ago and we need to stop. Um, and I, and I also love the teacher center. I, th I think we can't lose the teacher centers. I think we can't lose sight of the fact that the number one, um, the, the number one input in creating quality education for kids, the number one in school factor is the quality of the teacher, teacher. in the classroom. Yes. And we cannot lose sight of that. And, and that means that for all children in our district, we have the opportunity to create great school for all of our kids. And it does not have to be episodic. It does not have to be um, based on race, on gender, on um, socioeconomic status. So that's all I have to say. And Mr. Walker is going to finish us out. Thank you. Um, Again, thank you for, for all of this. I think uh, what I appreciate most, aside from the amount of hours uh, and time that you spent in Pittsburgh, uh, you're always welcome to, to relocate. Um, what, what I think was most important, though, is uh, between the first uh, proposal and this one, is um, it, it feels like uh, that our community uh, was heard, listened to, heard, and taken into account, uh, understanding that not everybody gets what they want uh, in these kind of things. Um, I think it's really, uh, you should be applauded for the amount of time you spent kind of really listening to uh, the people in our communities. And, and that, that listening will continue after you all go back home because there are still so many decisions to be made. Um, and I'm not going to get into like the school by school, but I did want to ask just about um, the Morrow building. Uh, in the original proposal, it proposed moving the uh, six to eight out, moving the K to five to the intermediate building. Is that still the plan to uh, vacate the primary building as a part of For the school? Morrow? Yeah. Because they operate the K to eight, but in two separate buildings. Yes. That is still the plan? Let me just verify. You can keep asking. I'm going to look. Okay. And or have That's the only like school-based question I'm going to ask. Yeah. The, the other two. Uh, Roosevelt, I know the answer to. Morrow, I can't remember. So let me. Mm. Let me. The other one up. moves on to transportation. Uh, okay. And so I know that um, you conservatively uh, kind of gave a, a, a net neutral. Um, but in my brain, uh, it. It just seems to reason that by um, standardizing as best we can that K-5 to experience, uh, seeing that our K-5 to students are the primary users of yellow school buses, uh, that we would see a significant change in how we access and use school buses around the city, which potentially brings significant savings. And I'll use my neighborhood as, a, as an example. I live in Brighton Heights. Um, there may be 15 kids waiting for a school bus on any given morning, and there are seven buses that come to pick up those 15 kids to take them all over the city. Under this plan, theoretically, they would go, they would either walk to school or be at a school, you know, two, two and a half miles away, in which case you send one bus to pick up 15 Correct. kids. Correct and take them so I don't want to like uh, over speak but the transportation director did see that there could be some efficiencies um, here but they want to really be able to do their due diligence with by mapping sure um, which is why we um, have it as a cost neutral no I get that I'm just you know in my brain it's like if I go from five buses to, to one bus that saves me a lot of money saves me a lot of time uh, understanding that then we, we, because we're moving our six to eight students, you know, that changes that number. Like, I, I get where you're getting it from, but 
the transportation concern that I have is most specifically for our youngest, uh, our youngest kiddos uh, because they are the ones more likely to fall asleep on the way home because they have a 45 minute bus ride and then end up at the bus depot, which is not the place where they should end up. Uh, and so thinking through that, right, keeping our kids closer to home they would be uh, closer. in the early grades and as they get older, and as parents, as we're willing to let them go further and further away from home, it just makes sense. So um, I think there's some significant savings there, but we can get into that. I think there's opportunity for sure. I, I uh, think so too. Yeah, I think there's opportunity. Um, I do want to answer your question about the Morrow Intermediate. It would house the K-5, and the primary building would close. Okay, that's what I thought. I yes. just wanted to make sure. And then there would be potential construction that happens at the intermediate building to increase capacity. Cool. Yes. Um, the last one that I want to get to is your timeline, your implementation timeline, because I think that yes. the dates are off and people are going to lose their minds if we don't uh, clarify that. Um, so I know that uh, on that slide it talks about spring of 2025, uh, but there is zero chance that we're changing schools mid-year on people. So what I mean by that. that is that the action would take place, okay. but you wouldn't actually change anything in the school. Okay, so that, so, makes, that makes a difference. So um, it's the end of the school year that the change would take place. Right. Yes. Okay. No, we are not changing anything this school year at all. I, I was just following the, the Facebook comments and people were thank like you freaking for, out. Thank that, you for letting me know that. that. So they were gonna, we were nothing gonna changes this school year. Everything has to be uh, voted on, and what changes we're, we're making is that it would be voted on for the following year to be applied. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that for folks. So, uh, you go back. so when you talk about year one, then you're talking about um, year one is the approval year, the, the, the year that we are um, taking the recommendations, making the approvals. Year two would be the first year of yes. implementation which would look like that 26, yes. 27 school year. Yes. And then that three year kind of phase in would run us into like 28, 29. That is right. Yes. Right. That, I just wanted to clear that up because I Sorry. Know, yes, no, thank can, you for clarifying that. I can just see my email and everyone's email going crazy tomorrow. Um, so I wanted to make sure if anybody's oh, still watching. Global. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they are. Um, okay. That was my last question, and if you don't have any more comments, I wanted to move us into kind of what I think the path forward is. Is that okay with everyone? All right. Well, thank you all. Thank, thank you both you. very much. Um, here's what I think, and feel free to push back, say no. Um, um, but I think the next step uh, should be us asking Dr. Walters and his team to look at this plan and provide a feasibility report. Um, and if you guys are okay, I will ask him while he's sitting next to me uh, to within you know the next week or so, give us a timeline of when that could happen. Um, yes. Sorry, my only, my concern is that as we're going through Council of Great City Schools training and, and all of this, I think at least waiting, like Dr. Walters can do whatever he's doing, but I don't think we should be like necessarily talking about or thinking about this plan until after our retreat on the 26th, because isn't that where we're supposed to kind of like set our like board, like goals, guide rails and all those other kinds of things. I feel like that sequence would just make sense. Yeah, I think that's fine. I, I think if he, you know, in the next week or so, because our, our next our training is on the 26th, so about 10 days from now, um, if he in the next week or so says, I need X amount of time before I can talk about the feasibility of the plan, would that make sense? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so just, and this is more for, for the public. So here's what I imagine and, and um, so the superintendent will, will look at this and tell us, like, does it make sense? Does it not make sense? Is there other suggestions or recommendations? We know that there is a community plan that has been presented that will get out to the public in some form or fashion in the next week or so. Uh, um, 
And, you know, so all of those things need to be considered and we want to make sure that Dr. Walters and his team have time to, to digest that and do that for us. Uh, and so the next step is for that report to come from the superintendent. And then after that, that's when I think we would t start to talk about a potential vote. Uh, and so I think we're still weeks away, like several, maybe five, six weeks. Um, but I think, I think that makes sense. And so if no one disagrees. Um, Sorry, Mr. Walker. And also, like, again, as Dr. Walters is doing this work, but, you know, if we have other questions, because I think it was Ms. Silk or Ms. Talaferi who asked this before of, like, well, what if as we're reading this, we have questions that we want to get back to ERS? So should we also like set a time period for ourselves to get questions to Dr. King Smith, to get back to us, to get to Dr. Walters? I, I don't know if they're under contract after tonight to answer more questions. So I think our next round of questions have to be focused or probably should be focused to the superintendent mm -hmm. as he does this evaluation. So maybe he answers some of those things in the feasibility report and maybe they're outstanding, but um, I would be hard pressed to ask them to do free work. Um, Cause yeah, that's not good. All right. So with that then, Dr. Walters, the ball is in your court uh, to give us a timeline over the next, you know, week to 10 days of how long it will take you to digest this and get us a feasibility report. And Ms. Talaferro has a question. Um, so you mentioned, uh, so after a f feasibility report would happen, you mentioned then we would be looking at <coughs> a potential vote. You said five or six weeks maybe, but that seems like prior, that seems like December maybe. Well, I guess it depends on when the feasibility thing would happen, but is it realistic that we would even have a, any type of voting about a final plan before the the end of the year, that's not realistic. Well, no, I'm not saying that we have a vote before the end of the year. I said after his feasibility plan is when we, when we begin the discussion about when that vote okay. would or could happen. Okay, I just wanted to make sure yep. that was, it was clear. Okay, thank you. And I say that because every time we have one of these presentations, someone asks me if there's gonna be a vote next week. And so no, there's not gonna be a vote next week uh, and likely will not be a vote in November. Um, until we have a discussion, and that discussion will happen in a forum similar to this, um, so that everyone knows what's happening. So I will turn it over. I'm all done, I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Reed. Well, um, if all hearts and minds are clear, <laughs> thank you very much, and uh, this meeting is adjourned.